School Committee, and tonight is Thursday, January 9th, 2014, and it is 6.30 p.m. Uh, Happy New Year, everyone. I hope you all had a very, very nice holiday and a good break. Um, I know the Pierce family household was very excited for school to start again this week. Uh, how, any New Year's resolutions that the school committee would like to offer in public? <laughs> can get you on the record and talk about it at the end of the year. No? None? I have none. Okay, and no opening remarks, but that is not a New Year's resolution. I will come back with opening remarks, hopefully on the 23rd. Um, unfortunately, we also don't have the happenings around the Arlington Public Schools this evening. We were going to hear a presentation from our math uh, director, uh, Matthew Coleman, and uh, some math coaches, but unfortunately there were some conflicts that arose, and they could not be with us tonight, but they will be back. Uh, he's very eager to inform us about what the math coaches are doing with the schools, and we're, uh, we're going to have them back here. I do not see any public participation, so already the first meeting of the year in 2014 is running to a rolling start. We're going to ask Ms. Leilani D'Agostino to come join us here um, for a presentation on our buffer zone analysis, elementary central registration, which I know had been worked on so hard last year. Good evening, Leilani, good to see you again. I want to introduce Leilani D'Agostino, who is known to all of you, but for those that are, are watching this evening, um, uh, Leilani is our Director of Data Integration and has been the architect uh, along with um, Adam Krosky for the central registration, which and is, has been the person, because she's been in central registration, to work very closely with me on the implementation of the buffer zone policy. So I'm going to let Le Leilani's going to do most of the presentation, but we're both going to be available for questions because we've worked very closely on this over the, over the past year. Um, and um, we, I know there's been some questions from uh, members of the committee, and hopefully those questions will get answered this evening. Um, so anyway, Leilani. did and I'd like to start out by just by telling you that it is a success so no matter what the data and the numbers are looking at we we have seen positive things in our presentation and I know that term drown them in data I've been told I may have done that a little bit so I apologize up front if I send too many numbers and I'll try to explain them and I will try to answer all the questions that were put before me I think I hope I have but if I have not please feel free to ask the questions Hopefully I have the data. If I do not, I will get it to you as soon as possible if there's anything further that I didn't cover in my presentation. But um, so starting with the original goal that was presented to me uh, was to develop centralized registration, including the restricting guidelines. And so we really tried to work on that. So the first question was, how do we do it? We have to centralize everything. So I have to start by telling you that there's a zillion people to thank. Dr. Bodie gave me great credit, thank you very much, but obviously I need to thank her because our partnership is, is very tight for this project and we meet uh, regularly. In addition to her, Adam created all of our screens. So he took paper and he put them online. And so when a parent goes to register, they are not spending hours filling out papers, they're doing it right online. And we are always tweaking. Actually, I'll be meeting with Adam at eight o'clock tomorrow morning for our final revisions for the next cycle of central registration starting in March. Um, every single school secretary has jumped on board with this. When a parent walks into the school and says, I want to register, they are sending them to central registration. So that's a big thing and we appreciate all of their dedication in this project. Um, all of Dr. Bodie's secretaries, I think I call up there a hundred times a day sometimes. They're answering all my questions. The two parents, Maria, I want to thank them. My data assistant, Kathy Meehan, has been plowing through data with me for a year. So I'm sure I forgot somebody. So whoever it is I forgot out there, thank you so much for all your help. So we centralized it, and then we said, well, what does that mean? What, you know, how, we, how is this going to affect our buffer zones? What are we going to do with this? And we found a location. And that location's my office. Isn't it beautiful? I, I have the most beautiful office in the system, I think. Um, 
676 people total are registered into the Arlington Public Schools. I think that number is somewhere in this presentation. 401 of them registered between the beginning of March and the end of March last year. So that leaves another 275 who sat in that office to register. <laughs> so it's, it's a nice place to go. It's a welcoming place. It's a, it's a place that they know how to get to. So we have passed almost 300 people through that office. So that's, that's fun. That's a, like a fun piece of data. And that's all I'm going to say about that. I'm going to move right to the buffer zone because I know that's what you're interested in talking about tonight. So I'll move right to the information on the buffer zone. The buffer zone came with two big goals that we had to keep in mind the whole time we were doing central registration. One of them was that we wanted to try to increase the Thompson Elementary School enrollment to 380 because that was uh, the design number. And we are pretty close to that 380. I believe we're at uh, 362. I'm going to have to put on my glasses for the first time ever in my 19 years in the Arlington Public Schools that I need to put on reading glasses to see what it is that I'm talking to you about. Um, but I believe it's 362. We didn't get to the 380, but that might be a good thing because the school opened this year and the growing capacity in Arlington is huge. So we're 20 students under. Is that accurate, Dr. Bodie? Is that 362. Mm -hmm. And um, the second was to create mechanisms to equalize class sizes to the best of our abilities in the elementary schools. And I'm going to say that we, we have seen a lot of, of shifting, making classes more equal. And you'll see a lot of the numbers. So whatever we're looking at in numbers, we have seen positive results in both of those areas. So we are pleased with those results. We can always be moving forward and doing a little more, but we are pleased with where we have started and where we've gone thus far. Some information on the buffer zones that's just kind of interesting to, 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 to keep in mind while we're talking about them is that buffer zones are students in grades K through 5. And um, it started in March of last year, and it ran until June. If a student walked in the door that needed to be placed in a school immediately, those children are counted, as well as the students who are registering at the beginning of this academic year. So it really was a large number of, of children. 23% um, of the land area of the town accounts for these buffer zones. So that's, that's good. That's a, a nice, that's, that's nice. Uh, our registration dates went from 3-7-2013 until October 31st. We could have cut it off at the beginning of the school year, but I wanted to give you the most data that we could, so we just extended it a little further. There were no registrations in the month of November this year. Um, and the total number of students who registered was 676. We mentioned that before. And the number of students who registered that are in a buffer zone was 145. So of the 676, 145 were these buffer zone children. And then I just broke it down for you. If you add up those numbers, they might not equal 145. I know they don't. Um, and I put that on there on purpose because I wanted you to see how dynamic it is with, with registration in general. We think of numbers, but these are children. and so. Kids are passing in and out. So when we first started, we did have 146, and then that person left our school system. But I counted that in there because when we were looking at the numbers that were in the buffer zones in kindergarten, there were 97, but one person did leave. So that was not a math error. Knock on wood. <laughs> um, this, is, this is a picture that I thought I could use to help you better understand what some of the things were that we took into account when we were doing buffer zones. Can I get up or do I have to stay here? Can I go okay. to the hotel? Yeah, sure. <laughs> You'll be on the mic. You can bring the mic with you or? Bring no, I'll talk really loud. Talk, just, but they won't the hear you when you go to Arlington. Okay, well, so maybe I'll. You can take the mic with you. I can take the mic with me? Just lift up yep. the whole thing. Just lift it up. Lift just just whole take thing. the whole stand. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So what you're looking at here, if you look at that first line, and these are people who've come through the door this week. It's Thursday. So these are our registrations from Monday till today. So that's pretty cool. We're always getting registrations. But if you look at the one that says Stratton HP and then it says Pierce Stratton, that represents someone coming in the Pierce Stratton buffer zone. How do we make that decision to put the child into the Stratton? We looked at the numbers. And we said, well, there's only 42 students at the Pierce School, but if you look at those numbers, there's only two classrooms. 
and there's three classes at the Stratton. It's 59 kids, but there's three classes. So we really do take each case and look at them very, very individually. We did the same thing for the Bishop Stratton. The kindergarten, the numbers aren't that different. However, the brother was entering second grade. And if you look at the numbers for the second grade, 25, 25, 26, versus 21, 20, 21. And we always keep the siblings together. So that's how we made that decision. So it's one by one. We don't just ever make a decision quick. We take a look at the numbers. Poor Dr. Bodie is usually bothered by me. What should I do? <laughs> so, so just for confirmation. So I just wanted to show you that. I thought that was a nice thing to, to start to keep in mind when we're looking at the numbers and how we made these decisions. It's not just a quick decision. It's, we, we are thinking it through. Yeah. So, so to, be, to clarify that a little bit, what the process is that um, we, all the registrations goes into Leilani, but then she brings up the list of decisions to me. And so I think we've spent hours doing this since, uh, since this started. Um, but I think that um, our process has become a little bit more clear. So then I, I make the decision and then the letters are sent out from my office and then Leilani enters that data into the computer. Thank you. Continuing on with our little tidbits. Um, buffer zone students who were immediately placed in their preferred school is 120. That's excellent. Remember there were 145, so 120 of them right away. We've placed them exactly where they wanted to go, not counting wait lists, just placing them on their preferred school. So we really did try very hard to be placing children or parents and children where they, where they wanted to be. Um, buffer students initially not placed in their preferred school, there were 25. And of those 25, 17 did say, yes, I'd like to be on a wait list. So if there's an opening, I'd like to be able to go in there. Um, students initially not placed in their preferred school and did not get requests to be on the uh, wait list were eight. So they said, you know, place us where you, where you wish. And students who did not get preferred school but did not request a wait list, but a decision was made by weighing something was one. There was a situation in the town where we really need to look at the child, look at our facilities, which facility could handle the needs of this child. So like Dr. Bodie had said a few minutes ago, nothing was a rush decision. Everything was really weighed out and thought, thought through. Did you skip the very top one? That was like a repeat by mistake. That's a typographical error. I apologize for that in the presentation. Um, it should have been 17, and it's the same thing that was on the previous page. Buffer zone students who preferred school was not honored, but waitlist request was, was four out of those 11 kids. And those who were not honored was 11 children. That's not, uh, that's not such a bad number, 11 out of all the buffer zones children. All the, and the buffer zone students whose waitlist request could not be honored because they left the district was two. So by the start of the 2013-14 year, 124 out of 145 students were placed in their preferred school. Um, I think that that's a, that's a great stat. I think it's like 86% or something. So we really did make lots of effort. And I think that even the children who were not placed, those 11 children, a lot of conversation went into these people. We did not just say, oh, sorry, you didn't get what you wanted. We actually spoke with parents, we explained the situation, we helped them understand what a buffer zone was about. That slide I showed you at the beginning, we're replacing someone, even though I used January data, we still have that on a slide for parents when they come into my office so that we can explain to them how our decisions are made. And most parents, can't, I don't know if all, but most parents agree with it in the end. They said, I do want my child in a smaller class, I understand what you're working for, what you're striving for. So this is my um, drowning you in data slide. I know it was extremely difficult to, to even comprehend what it was I was trying to do with the slide. I wanted us to be able to take a look and see with these buffer zones. It's important for us. What would happen if we didn't have the buffer zone? How did these buffer zones affect things? Did, did it make the class sizes smaller? Did it make the school sizes smaller? And sometimes the answer is no for the school total. But for the class totals, were they smaller? Were they more? equal, and the answer in most cases is yes. So I took this slide just to throw it in there and, and uh, you know, make everybody be like, what? And I broke it down for you. So I'm going to get up again. I'm going to get up again. This is kind of a neat thing. <laughs> but I promise this is the last time I'll get up. And I just wanted you to understand what you're looking at. This I pulled just the fourth grade, and I kind of color-coded it for you. So at the Bishop School, 
the Bishop Stratton in grade four, if we did not have a buffer zone, we would have one increase in fourth grade and we would have one decrease in Stratton school because the Stratton child went, the buffer Stratton child went to the Stratton and not the buffer. A bracket, I'm sorry, Bishop. Does that make sense? Um, and that's true for the bracket, the Allen bracket. We placed the child originally into the bracket. So if I took that child out and put them back into the down, the down numbers would go up by two and the bracket numbers would go down by two. So this is one of those slides that if you have nothing else to do, you want to really challenge your mind, feel free to look at this slide and I'd be happy to re-explain this again if you look at it and have any questions. But what it, what it was designed for is to let you see where are the impacts from one year to the next. Yes. So I had, okay, so the, when you talked about with the bracket, so if there wasn't a buffer zone, then the bracket cohort would be up would be down by two, so there would be two less students? I'm At sorry. I school, if, if yes, so there are 75 children today, mm -hmm. and if we didn't have the, brack, the buffer, there would be 73. So that is a, that is a smaller class size, but it's, it's, it's balancing out another class size, another school and another class. What complicates this a little bit is that um, almost all the schools um, have two buffer zones. And so for <laughs> Bracket, Bracket has a buffer zone with Dallin and it also has one with Bishop. So the, while these decisions are made individually, there is um, a, a holistic look at what's happening in the trends. So the only way we thought that made any sense to capture this a little bit was just to show the total net effect when you when you account for both buffer zones and in some cases yes the total number went uh, went you know maybe a little counterintuitive but the decision wasn't made on the total number of students in the school but rather what effect a particular student had on class sizes at a particular grade level and um, so when we actually assembled the data it was a little it, it was a little surprising to see that actually if we had no buffer zones, in a couple of cases, the school numbers would be actually lower. But that wasn't the, that wasn't the primary goal. I'm still just a little confused. So the number, the up means what it would, I mean, the, the ones with the arrows are what it would have been if you didn't have the buffer zone. So the, the Bishop Stratton, that first one, if that Bishop Stratton, we placed the child into the Stratton. And so that number 64 represents that child at the Stratton. If we didn't put that child in the Stratton, that child would have been in the Bishop, which would have increased that class size by one. So right now they have 58 children. Okay. And if we didn't put that one buffer zone student into the Stratton school and we left that child in the Bishop school, there would be 59 children in the Bishop fourth grade. Okay. I know, it's like overwhelmingly. <laughs> but but uh, we, we just wanted you to s be able to see, in some cases, it is plus, in some case it is minus, but we just wanted you to be able to see the numbers and how they are affected. Is that, is that yeah. And then what I did for the rest of this presentation, I know you've, you've seen this in, in, in your packets, but for the people watching, is we kind of broke down one just to show you what, does a, what did a buffer zone look like. So at the Bishop Bracket buffer zone, there were 15 children. Of those 15, nine of them preferred bishop and six preferred bracket, 12 were placed at bishop and three were placed at bracket. But everybody got what they wanted in, in that, it, that the people on the wait list did not get placed until the requested school was zero. So even with those, we are honoring the request because remember there are, there are children who didn't have a wait list request. Put us wherever, wherever you feel, feel fit, fit. So even though you look at those numbers and it says six preferred the bracket and three were placed, those remaining people said, I don't, I don't care where you put me. Put, put us wherever's best. We like all the schools in the town. And I think that was a really good thing, too, having 
being the director of data, I'm always looking at the numbers. And a lot of our schools are very comparable to one another. And so this was a nice opportunity to say, it's okay not to be in this school, to be in that school. And parents said, you know what, it really is. Our data is good. We, had a, we have a lot of strong data. I'll just go through these quickly. I don't have to spend a lot of time on this. But the same idea as that first slide, there were 25 students in the Bishop Stratton. And in the, in the end, 17 were placed in the Bishop, eight in the Stratton. And only one family or student did not get their request. Bishop Thompson, uh, nine were at the Bishop, one was at the Thompson, and zero children or, vi or families did not get their request. So we're always happy when that number's zero. Um, bracket Bishop, you'll notice a couple slides before was the Bishop bracket, now we're at the bracket Bishop. They are two different buffer zones. So those, these children would have been at the bracket, but now we have the choice to put them in the bracket or the Bishop. And again, only one student wasn't able to be satisfied with our, with our waitlist requests. The bracket Dallin, only uh, no, no students were left unrequested. The Dallin bracket, couldn't place a Dallin five at bracket with one student not getting their request. The Dallin Pierce, four at Dallin, zero at Pierce um, with one student not being able to get the request. Hardy Thompson, 17 at Hardy, one at Thompson with zero. Um, and then one, that I, there I wanted to show you sometimes where these numbers are coming from that they didn't request anything. Uh, Pierce Dallin, Pierce Stratton. I don't, I'm just not going to read them all because uh, people watching this even seeing this too. I don't want to be too repetitious because I only have a 30 minute limit, I think, right? Um, Stratton Bishop, Stratton Pierce, Thompson Hardy. And then, that, and then I just total on this screen for you, I wanted to let you know what waitlist students were not placed in requested school. I just displayed that for you. So you could see our total numbers is, is 11. So it really is a very small number when we're looking at 145 children being in the buffers and 25 not getting placed. So we're looking at some small numbers. This puts it in a chart. Some people enjoy watching the pretty pictures. I like the pictures. I was all proud when I could find all seven elementary schools in a picture. Um, but the reality is some people would rather just see a chart. So there it is in chart form. And that concludes my presentation. Um, I, I, I did take a look at the questions that were asked. I, I hope in, in different ways they were answered. Again, if there's anything I haven't answered, I'd be happy to answer. I know there was a question about the average number of students in a class. And we did put that into, into, into the slide. We did add the average. So some of the data has been put in different in places, opposed to just one slide for it just for itself. Thank you. Thank you. Questions from the committee? Ms. Heim? Um, I did want to just ask about the Thompson, um, because one of the decisions that drove this um, was the desire to increase the Thompson's enrollment. And when I see that there were four students that wanted to be at the Thompson that were not, that wasn't able to be honored, um, it does make me wonder what drove that. Was it that it did, um, it was grade level specific and that's why it couldn't be honored? Or, um, and I realize if you need to, time to research that specifically, that is a specific question. And I, I remember this very clearly, <laughs> I would in interrupt Eli's answer, because yes, saying I, it was, um, there, was several, there were a couple of times when we didn't place a student at Thompson, and you would think that we would try and up that number. But what would, it, what would have happened is that if you look in the Thompson numbers, you'll see some very large class sizes that occur in certain grades. In fact, um, if you look um, at grade three, it is particularly large, and it turns out I think two of those students were at grade three. And we just didn't want to get class size up in the 28 and 29 range. So that was the, that was the issue. And I remember having that discussion with Leilani saying this is counterintuitive, that here we're trying to get the numbers up for Thompson, but we just couldn't do it because of class sizes. And that's why I was assuming had happened, but I really yeah. wanted to make sure and, that. And, 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 it, and like just to tag on, on what she said, two of them were absolutely that second grade. So you see there's 25 already in that class. And one was third grade, which again has those, those numbers of 26, 27. And the other one was kindergarten. So if we, 
you know, that was 23, 23. But the, definitely the second and the third were driven totally by the numbers in the classes. Okay, and then my understanding is as well, having worked on the redistrict plan, is that if there's no room for one child at a certain level, we try to keep families together in the same building so that might impact another child in a grade where there mm -hmm. is space. And we honored every single family has been kept together. There was, there was no separations at all. So. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Schlichten? Yeah, I, I, the numbers were interesting. I, I like the last slide the best. I knew you would. Well, you, well, you know. <laughs> And, and that wasn't in the handout. It, 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 that's it's the, on the purple. Oh, it, on the purple. I've got a yellow. Okay, so the that's on the purple. Underneath. Okay. Oh. See, that's, that's just why I hate the paper. You know, it's, it's uh, counterintuitive. But that, that really tells a story. I, I, think, I think that, first of all, when we went into the uh, buffer zones, it was sort of uncharted territory. We didn't know what we were going to get. And it really confirms that, uh, as a committee, we made the right decision and came up with a working model that actually had some flexibility. And the, the one summary statistic that we got was the place that people, more people wanted to go and got bounced out of was the Thompson. So we were, you know, it, it became a very highly desired school, which is one of the things that we have been working on. And that new building has just put such a spin on the place that people want to go there. And, and that, that's just very heartening. Right. Because if uh, 10 years ago, before we started our rebuild and before people knew how good the Thompson was, <clears throat> that wouldn't have been the case. So congratulations to everybody at the Thompson who's made that a really desirable school. And uh, it just this, this was better than we could have hoped for. It was. Dr. Allison Anthony. Um, I also like this chart, but I think maybe you want to go back and double ch or I like the one that was there before it's disappeared. Um, the averages, I think some of them are not uh, correct. Um, for example, the Dolan at third grade. Um, the other one? I think the division was done by a three instead of a four, four classes. Okay, so we will definitely go back and check yeah, on that Yeah, so we need to get that. And just speaking for myself, I would have liked to have seen both the people who come in and who go out, not just the net. Because okay. I'd like to know how much, how many people are being affected, not just the total well, now that we have like the template sheet, I can do that very easily for you. Okay. So we will do that and send. Yeah, that. so it could just be you know yep. an up going in or out and a down going in or whatever, but both numbers, not just the net. Okay. Okay. Thank you. We have that sheet already, so yes. We do. I, I just want to say that's not the summary chart. I like the other one, the, the one you showed at the very end. Can we flip to the end of all your pretty pictures? That's well, well done too. I've that one. That's that's the one I'd like to get a copy of. I don't yeah. think we have that. In okay. Yeah, sure. we don't have. You're right. That, that's the one I want. That's sure. that really tells the story. Yeah, um, we could all. Yeah. We'll send it to you. Thank all. you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions uh, for Ms. Dagestan? Mm -hmm. Can you talk about there were deadlines set for when people had to be notified for when they would be moved and <coughs> where they would be placed? Were all the deadlines met, or what happened with them? So this is this is a, an area. All the deadlines were met in the sense that all children were in classes for the first day of school. Um, but I'm gonna say this is one of the areas that we have talked a lot about. And what, what we find, and even Dr. Chesson and I were talking about that even today, is I'm a, 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 an exaggerated example, not picking on any school. I'm a parent at the Pierce School and I go away for the summer. And I know I'm a Pierce parent, I'm not in a buffer zone. I can register anytime I want because I'm in the peer school. I'm not in a buffer zone. So that parent not walking through the door ties up all of our interactions because we can't work on these buffer zones until we know the <coughs> people in the classes. So we have talked about, is, are there ways, should we be doing ways to in, do incentives to get, to get registration done for people who are not in the buffer zones? I can tell you those buffer zone parents, they were in immediately. Those dates, we date stamped every person that walks through the door and though they went on waited lists by the date stamp, they were in these buildings immediately for our registration days. So there was a lag. We were able to get them. We, we were on the phone with people. We sent out a second mailing to people. So we did all kinds of things to get them in, but that was, that was something that we did struggle with. Okay, because I'm thinking about the policy had some deadlines when we would <coughs> notify people of their assignment. So it sounds like we weren't meeting those deadlines. No, we did meet the deadlines in terms of when they <coughs> were to be notified. Absolutely met those deadlines. 
uh, what what Leilani is referring to um, <coughs> is, is is that there is constant stream, and of course the volume of the stream was uh, was very significant this year. So we would make a, des a decision based on the best information we had. But then th there were some people that we just said, you know, we this is where your placement is going to be. Do you want to be in a wait list for your preferred? And we did got we got back to a number of people in August um, on that, and I forget what the, the actual numbers were. I don't know that I have that number handy, but we certainly <coughs> looked we did, that up. We, we did. We we yes. told people that we'd get back, but even then, even after August, we had a con continuous through September, we, and October really. You were almost having people daily, multiple people daily, as we were registering students. So, that is the part that's a little that was a little bit um, difficult. Is that uh, you didn't have the complete didn't have the complete picture, and in fact, I think there was one case <coughs> where we, um, and I won't mention the school or the buffer zone, where we actually went back to a family and said, "This really isn't going to work out. How about if we just move you back to this other school?" And they were fine with it. So, but that happened because the numbers just became too skewed, too large um, as we went through the summer. And Dr. Bodie, we had 34 people register between September and October, mm -hmm. so that that's a significant number of people yeah. to be registering during the during the school year. So, mm -hmm. right. Um, this is something f for consideration, not for response. But um, when you were talking about incentivizing people that know that they're not in the buffers. Um, I would wonder if there could be some sort of special arrangement for children that are assigned by a certain day to have like a, a, over the summer reading opportunity with their building principal or something like that, which um, you know like would mean that people would have to have their kid's name on the list and they could like do some sort of social event for the incoming kindergarten classrooms. And that way it would certainly be beneficial um, for them to do, give it in a more timely manner because um, it seems like part of the meeting versus nebulousness around the deadlines is we're, we're meeting the deadlines, but if we had more accurate information up front, we might actually be able to better honor par parental preferences. And um, so, you know, I would hope that, I'm sure with the elementary principals that there could be other ideas that would be generated to um, pretty much make it beneficial yeah. for that to happen sooner. We will right. think we will work on that. Thank you. Yeah, we've, we've been doing some brainstorming too on that on that issue because it, it, it is an important way. We, it's, it's also helpful in terms of class lists. You know, the, the principals will start out with trying to keep everything very even and they, mm -hmm. and in fact, um, again, I won't mention the school, you know, some of the registrations that came in had we known uh, some of the um, needs of these students prior to later in the summer, there may have been a different configuration of those classrooms. So, I mean, those are all issues as well. But, um, you know, y we're learning from this, and um, I think there's some factors that m we won't entirely be able to control. Um, certainly, the number of students that are enro enrolling here. But um, as far as the process went, as my, my memo to you on this, it, it actually, other than being time consuming, was very straightforward. And we followed to a T the date stamps. So when we had an opportunity to, to um, go back and, and see that there was a possibility of somebody getting off the wait list, we absolutely followed the order in which they uh, registered, which was what we had said we would do. And we didn't skip over unless the person said they didn't want to do it. And there was a couple cases like that too. I just have a question on the central registration. Can you tell us if there are benefits financially for the district to have the central registration? And what you found uh, by, by experiencing it firsthand, is it, is it more streamlined for the parents as well as the administration? Uh, what are some of the benefits to, to having it this way? I think the parents enjoyed it. <laughs> Your office is lovely. Um, knock on wood, I didn't have any parents like mad at me in the office. Um, I think that really what it's done is it's made it very effective for for us opposed to the secretary there are seven elementary school secretaries there's a busy women they are very busy and when the parents were coming in before with a hand filled out 
eight page registration, mm. that data has to get entered into the computer. So what we've been doing, because it is online now, is we download that data and we clean it up. There, there is changing the headers and all different things. And then we are importing the six fields that go directly to the state for our state reporting, we're importing those. So we're actually kind of doing two things at the same time because we're preparing our data for state reporting while we're importing the children and registering them into, into the student information system. So that's like a, a huge thing. Um, I know how valuable time is. My brother has six children. So my brother goes from school to school to school and he's always telling me this so I'm, I, I am listening a little bit. And so I, I have really worked on, on what it takes to get a parent in the door and out the door quickly. And we can, if a parent has printed the material and signed it, we can get a parent in my office and out the door in less than 10 minutes. So there's, there's work to be done once they leave in, in, in terms of registering the child into the computer, but there is no parent in my office for more than 10 minutes if they come in with their materials. So that I think is, is a good thing. Central registration, those kindergarten nights, yes, sometimes you are kind of waiting in a little bit of a line, but I think that we really got that down too by the second or third vi you know, visit. We really had a process for them to move pretty quickly. So that's, that's, a nice, that's a nice plus when I'm on the phone with someone and they say to me, I work, and I say, can you come and see me at 7.30? I can have you in and out in less than 10 minutes. We do, we do keep that promise to them. So those are some pluses. Did you want more? And I don't no, know the financial part mm -hmm. of it, but. Well, um, there's, there's some other pluses too. R the right now in the kindergarten and the um, elementary, the building secretaries do not work in the summer. They may come in for a couple of days, m more time than not that they use the days toward the end of the school year. Um, so we can wait until August to sometimes get these numbers in and given the enrollment growth we've been seeing, uh, that would have been really uh, a very difficult thing to be scrambling at the end of the summer trying to hire teachers. Remember, last year we hired five teachers. The year before I think it was only one, but still, if we were trying to do that in August when we were finally getting all the data, because uh, sometimes it could sit on people's desks for a month and we wouldn't even know that these children, they send them in and it could sit there. So mm -hmm. in terms of managing um, just cl classroom numbers, um, the, the policy also took a little bit of an edge off of class sizes. I wouldn't say it did major re you know, changes. You'll, you, you look at the data here, you can see we still have large class sizes and in some schools they're larger than others but it helped a little bit. And sometimes it's that little bit that can make, it, make a difference. But I think of the two things, knowing where we stood in enrollment, as we went through the summer, we were able to make very um, uh, in, important decisions, giving principals time to go through a hiring process that we would not have been able to do without central registration. Can I tag off of her on that too? Because it, it made me think of something. Another thing I think is a big plus is, is the communication piece, piece. Once you leave my office, it, it starts a whole other process, getting the child into the computer. We take that information and we can pass it to the principal, mm -hmm. but we are also passing it to the ELL director if needed, we're passing it to special education, we're passing it to the head nurse. So mm -hmm. they are receiving that information within 24 hours of someone leaving my office. Mm -hmm. So lots of people are touching the information and, and is certainly for special education and ELL, it's good to have those numbers and those heads up ahead of time, so. That's great, Mr. Hamm. Is the ELL office responsible for getting records from out of district? Or no. security? That's still left to the uh, receiving school? But it's, it's, it's within my packet, so I am checking to see that the parent has filled out that information and that we do have the information to get the information. But that goes, it's the responsibility of the receiving school. <coughs> Thank yes. You. Dr. Allison. Are there any plans for rolling central registration out towards um, middle school, high school? So that's Dr. Bodie's decision. However, what we have done is we have taken um, the registration packet and we have created it so that we could now go K to 12 across the entire district. <laughs> so there would be one K to five, there would be one six to eight, and there would be one nine to 12. So now, and that can begin whenever, whenever, I think we were talking about it, we're not sure what we're gonna do with it, but even if we don't have central registration, parents can then have the same format and the same packet straight across our district. Okay. Any other questions from the committee? Well, I'd like to thank you very, very much for coming tonight and explaining some of this kind of complex data to us and in a very understandable way, thank you. Thank, well, Mr. Thielman will tell you, I love, to, I love talking to school committee, don't I? I do. <laughs> I, do. Mm -hmm. I do, so thank you and happy new year to all Happy of you. new year. Thank, thank you. you, thanks, Leon.
Moving on then. <clears throat> we are up to uh, the part of the evening special education budget and program update. Uh, we have our interim director of special education uh, here tonight, Ms. Kathleen Lockyer, welcome. And Jill me. Parkin. Yes, thank you. Um, and Jill is one of the um, uh, coordinators in special oh, education. Yeah, one of our elementary coordinators. Um, before uh, Kathleen begins, I just want to um, explain why she's here. One of the things that you've heard from the principals over the, in December were um, the needs in their building. They included special education needs, but there are also global needs that, that, uh, that have been identified K-12, which um, some of you have heard already, but um, some of them the building principals may not have identified. And so that's the purpose tonight, is to give you an overview of all of it, um, K-12. Actually, pre I'm sorry, pre-K-12, really. Correct. Yeah. Right. So good evening, everybody. Um, nice to see you. Um, and nice to be back to school, as everybody said, after our two-week absence. Um, so I'm starting, actually, this, the document that we gave you is by levels. And we'll start with the preschool. Um, for those of you who um, may not know on the school committee, we've been doing quite a bit of work with our preschool program. Um, as a team, we've been meeting and really looking at programming, um, looking at philosophy, and looking at program quality. So uh, some of, at least one of the recommendation comes out of that work that we've been doing together. Um, the first on the list is there, this is actually moving what is now a point eight position to be a full-time position that was changed for really the request of a, per, a, a staff member. But we find just in trying to really think about program options, just that little bit of time causes some exceptions that we just we think are not helpful to the program planning. So that's the, that request. The next request for a BSP has to do with our um, our autism program at the preschool. We have a um, substantially separate uh, supportive learning classroom for students on the spectrum, and we anticipate an increase in staff in student body there. Um, and that's to really plan for that so that we have sufficient staffing for students who would be coming into the program. Um, the next recommendation is the one that came out of our work together. Um, at the preschool, we're actually running a, a little school. Um, we have over 100 students by the end of the year. If you don't know it, our special education students all come in on their third birthday. So the population changes during the course of the year. And um, obviously, our largest numbers are by the time we get to June. Um, so there's a lot of needs like there are for school secretaries at the other buildings, if for intake, for communication. So I really see this request for clerical assistance is to really free up a professional staff member who is doing that now. Um, and part of that rationale is that we do expect to be serving more students. Um, we're doing more, more, we have more program options that we have initiated this year and intend to. We, I know that things will expand because that's what we hear from every community. So in anticipation of that, I'd like professional staff to be available for education. And so I'm asking for a clerical position to be established to do a lot of the other things that need to happen. And also, parent outreach is a piece of that. Um, and moving on to, um, we have the middle school listed next. Um, the middle school, I do believe that both Ben Halfat and um, Mr. Ruggieri, the principal of the school, um, talked about many of the things <coughs> on this list. But I'll probably just give a slightly different spin to them. Um, under the first request, it's for a, a teacher. Um, who would be in the um, SLC um, B program, and that's based on increase in student population. It's also in, it's also aimed at retaining students in the general ed who may need some temporary support and outreach to general ed classrooms. Um, that's how that has been described. The need um, so that 
not to maintain students who may need some temporary support, but also for no increasing numbers <coughs> of referrals for those students. The, requ the next request is um, a social worker or a guidance counselor. Um, it's, it's actually a guidance counselor at the, at the middle school, but all of the, many of the guidance counselors are social workers, and that's um, how this, this position's seen. This is actually, um, again, we're doing a lot of work on social-emotional issues across the district, and one of the things that th the middle school has worked on is having their guidance staff be the first, um, the first people that intervene with students who have are exhibiting social emotional issues, are requesting services for that, <coughs> are identified needing them, and we feel that um, it, it is felt and it's been communicated to me that if we had another point five social worker that would be very helpful so that, that can, uh, those issues can be responded to. I think it's an expansion of a current person who is 0.5 to a 1.0 is what is intended. Um, and then the request for teaching assistance is um, we have a number of uh, small group sessions at the middle school, small classroom sessions for the SLC students, and this would be to expand inclusionary support for students who are leaving those smaller classrooms and transitioning into the larger classrooms based on progress. Um, that was the, the request for another TA who could work with the students, particularly in the inclusionary environments. Um, the substitute teacher uh, request is one that um, I believe was discussed, but it's related to um, the fact that we need to have a general education teacher at every IEP meeting and the challenges of covering classrooms to have that happen has been articulated both at the middle school and the high school. Um, so that request is directly related to having flexibility um, within I the school to be able to cover those classrooms effectively for attendance at IEP meetings. Moving on to the high school, um, <coughs> the first request is for a .5 team chair. Um, the rationale for that is uh, we've had 1.5 team chairs at the middle school, and we see that as an effective model, and for a number of reasons at the high school, um, because of the population, because of um, some transient needs, we no <coughs> longer see, f see a 1.0 team chair being sufficient um, for the needs there. Uh, it's, it's taking, it, it's a lot of stress and strain on the staff, relate all service staff to uh, respond to the needs of the team chair. So we're, we're looking to move our team chair staffing at the high school to be replicate that at the middle school. The related service, the SLCB social worker, um, it, there's, it, this would be within the SLCB program, um, but that also is where many of the students who from programs, from residences in the district um, come and enter that program from the transition program that we run. And that is requiring a great deal of assistance now and we feel we're understaffed in that area. Um, the other, um, the other request, the fault next request under related services is for a speech and language therapist. Um, the speech and language therapist uh, at the high school, we've really done a study of what the needs are for speech and language therapy at the high school, and in fact, um, we've I what we've identified is uh, a fairly high level of need within the. Um, autism program, the SLCA program, for um, uh, social thinking, social language, um, I I which is done both by social workers and speech and language therapists. And also within our language-based program, our language-based program primarily works with students who have a specific learning disability um, and a language-related disability. And um, Brian Sylvester is the teacher of that program, 
and we, um, we see that it would be very beneficial to be able to have a language therapist working or co-teaching with him. Um, I should mention that we're doing <coughs> quite a bit of co-teaching across all the schools, but in particular the middle school and the high school is doing a lot of co-teaching, um, special education and related service um, staff, special education and general education teachers. Um, both kinds of models of co-teaching are happening. Um, so, it, so we see a speech and language therapist, point five, um, needed at the high school, and, and, and we've really targeted what the need was. Um, previous to this, we have split a position between the middle school and the high school. There's actually, a, a, we're doing some co-teaching with a speech and language therapist at the middle school. She's working in the academic classrooms with teachers, um, working on building language related to curriculum. We're having a lot of success with that. And one of the other reasons why it didn't work to try to have one person at the secondary fill all the needs is because the difference in schedules. Um, with a differing schedule at the high school and the middle school, it just, th there was incongruity and caused a lot of uh, difficulty in really having a kind of very sane program for students. So that's another rationale for that request. Um, the next two teaching assistants, a, a teacher assistant and a BSP, is restoring staffing that we previously had to the SLCB. It's a pretty strong request from staff that they need the flexibility of those staff members. Um, the request for teaching assistants I know came from uh, the high school administrator. Um, there's been a great deal of difficulty in hiring and retaining teacher assistants at the high school level. Um, and that we, I see those teacher assistants as being people who can support curriculums in, in classrooms with the students, support the students within the curriculum of general education. And so the request is to move them up to a higher level TA and to increase their um, their salary. Um, my notation refers to the fact that I think it's, it's a district-wide need to look at the salaries of the uh, teaching assistants and um, for retention purposes and recruitment purposes. But this is a, 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 a special need that we've had this year is hiring at the high school level and retaining those that we do hire. Um, I, and then uh, the, the last item under the high school has to do with that language-based classroom that I mentioned before. Um, Brian Sylvester is doing an excellent job. Um, he's, I, I, but he has a very high caseload and uh, we anticipate a number of students moving in from the middle school. Uh, so just in anticipation of those needs increasing, um, I have asked for consideration of another teacher for the language-based classroom at the high school. Um, that is, by the way, one of the populations that um, we unfortunately see a number of peop students leave the district for support in that area, the specific learning disability program and language-related, um, language-based learning. Um, for students who have difficulties keeping up with the curriculum and need some specialized approaches in teaching in those areas. The, um, the next items are system-wide um, <coughs> positions and programs. And the first one relates to the BCBA. I do know that this is an identified need that the elementary principals made in their presentation. Um, yeah, I was told it was their primary need. We, we certainly can support that and agree that that is, um, that is y you know, a, a need system-wide. Um, how we do work with the, the BCBAs and the BSPs to whom, um, the BSPs that are paired with them, uh, Jill is, Jill Parkin is the person who oversees it um, and oversees where they're going to be working. So they're not placed in different schools. It really is responding to the needs of students. And she really organizes that piece of it. So we would see that being done the same way. Um, I know Jill spoke to this at the, the night of the elementary presentation and she'd be glad to speak to it further. But 
we've worked out a model where um, a BCBA and a BSP are paired and they respond on short term and sometimes a little bit longer term basis to students um, based on referrals from the schools across the district. Uh, the, the two OT positions are both currently the need that's identified is at the elementary level and OTs have been, o o t occupational therapists really provide excellent services to the students in our, in our schools. <coughs> but they've been particularly helpful in response to intervention or I t RTI services because they really know a lot about the environment of the classroom and some novel ways to present information to students and help them um, really perform the kinds of tasks that they need to within the curriculum of the classroom. <coughs> so the requests there are particularly in the area of RTI support, which um, I know has been articulated to you previously as a method that we, <coughs> we hold referrals down because if students can have different settings, di different environments, different methodology of support, um, and start doing well without addition leaving their classroom, that's beneficial to all. Um, that's the nature of that request. And the last is reserved for teaching assistance, which is something we have had in the budget and used sparingly this year. Um, and But it's been um, important to have the flexibility. <coughs> so those that's kind of an overview of the requests. And um, I'm glad to answer questions on anything. Uh, Mr. Hainer, uh, back up uh, on the, 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 the new clerk you asked for. You, in, you inputted $45,000. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, that's higher than a step one teacher. Uh, yes, sir. I'm just wondering. Sorry. Why so high? A uh, 12 month clerk. I just used a sort of ballpark number for what we're averaging for our 12 month clerk. Oh, okay. We're currently in negotiation agreement. <coughs> Okay. But I mean, you know, is I assumed a 12 month. It might okay. be a 10 month. You know, I think it's a 12 because but preschool is more 12 than 10. So. I mean, just off the top of my head, even if you <coughs> prorated the 10 to 12, we can, Sorry, we can, touch, we can discuss it. The substitute teacher one was left completely <coughs> blank. Is there a, it, does that come under the general ed budget or? It's already listed in the one of the middle schools. In the, in the regular general ed budget. budget. Um, I'd like us to consider, if we can, extrapolate it, put it in this budget. Uh, because what you did last year, uh, whoops, off. Uh, and <coughs> you, the professional staff one was left blank. Is there a reason for that down under the high school? Actually, uh, the reason for it is that it is anticipated SLD needs. And at the time that we drew this up, um, it was just a matter of really getting more data about numbers from the middle school. Um, I continue to see it as a need, um, so I think we can add some the salary reason, figure reason to I'm it. I'm asking is right now without the, the, those three spot, those set couple of spots I put in, we've come to a, 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 a certain figure. One thing I'd like to request is if we can a breakout of these positions that are basically IEP dependent. Mm -hmm. You understand what I mean? I, I, mm -hmm. as, as separate from support staff, staff that are basically going to be required to us to, ma uh, to implement or maintain the IEPs in existence. Well, uh, that's a good point to bring up with the fact that we haven't, you know, really detailed that the number there, um, because as of right now, we can fulfill all IEP needs. I want to make sure that you know everybody knows that. Without any of this addition. Well, we, we, as, as we, we are delivering services now, things will be, there is enhancements here that we feel like we need, but we are delivering services for all students. I, but I the, the issue is then, for, for instance, with this teacher, is how many of the, the specific learning disability students at the middle school will need this level of service? And that's what we're still teasing out. Right. I guess it's important for us that have to crunch numbers to understand 
what what flexibility we still have. Yes. For a better phrase. Yes. Yeah. Your opinion on that? Yes. Thank you. A and that's what I think. You know, at our cabinet meeting tomorrow, that's uh, you know a piece of what we're going to be discussing among uh, <coughs> all of us in the district. So and if, if you could provide the budget subcommittee a that breakout or for a better phrase, would yes, be, I think would appreciate that. Yeah, and, and the only thing, other thing I'd say is when you start thinking about this in October, uh, we're, we're now in January, I know the needs are a whole lot better in April than I do I in agree. October. Yeah. Ms. Stark. Um, so I think I have similar, um, you know, not, not necessarily what's required versus what's nice to have, but obviously prioritized of these, of course, if we couldn't grant all wishes, you know, what would be the, but I, I'm sure I know that that's something that everybody's going through with all their requests, so just kind of putting it out there. Um, when the um, elementary principals spoke to us and they talked about the need for more behavioral specialists, my understanding was that we needed like four more. No, we have two. We, this right? would bring us to three. Right? And yeah, I thought they wanted one in each school. Yes. No, I don't think they ever were Thank dreaming you. that high. Well, because the BCBAs, remember, are not just direct interventionists with the children. They're also training the staff in the schools to better manage the situation. They're not, they're not like a speech therapist or an OT where they're embedded in the infrastructure of the school. And they float around under Ms. Parker's direction to make sure that they're responding to what needs to happen at a given time. And it was felt that another one wouldn't spread them so thin, that, that they're providing necessary training not just to the kids but to the teachers, and that a third would really aid. A have I misspoken, or is that? No, uh, no, you know, I don't, I don't know that th if there was a presentation for a higher number. Um, the number that came to me was you know, one more would certainly help. Um, so I'd like Jill to speak to it. Hi, thank you. Um, I hear what you're saying, and I do understand where your question comes from because I was at the other meeting. Okay. Um, I think w one of the things to look at is the difference between the BSPs and the BCBAs. Okay. And if you had, um, I think the uh, one option that I think that was on the table was a looking at the number of BSPs, which is a higher level teaching assistant and um, is it possible to put more of the, that personnel in the elementary schools? And how, so how many of, so right now we have two BCBAs. And two floating district-wide BSPs. And two BSPs, okay. And so this would increase both of those by one. Correct. But I think that's where your question came from, and, and it's a relevant question. Oh, okay, yeah, because my understanding when I was, on my notes are that they wanted one in each school. So if I could speak to that a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Um, we had the, the really good experience to have um, Jessica Minahan, who is a BCBA um, and has written a very popular book, the name of which is? The Behavior Code. The Behavior Code. Um, she actually is a colleague of Jill's and um, also of Chris Carlson. Um, who's one of the other coordinators. And she, through the success grant, we were able to have her come in and she has, she's going to do some more training for us. And the reason that we had her come was, as we have seen in Arlington, um, as I know in interacting with other people in other towns, we've had pretty much an explosion of the I, I, the needs uh, needs of students in the social, emotional, and behavior realm. It's not just in this community, it's across this country, for sure. Um, Jessica is a national trainer, and <coughs> she, has, she has found some ways to work within the educational system, um, nothing really fancy, but very effective. And sh so she has come in and she actually did a training with our cabinet, so principals uh, um, and other administrators heard from her. And one of the things that, one of the premises she starts with is we all need to become behavior 
savvy teachers and educators. And that is part of the premise, is that the ability to respond to children with behavioral or social emotional needs, anxiety, the kinds of things that we're seeing across the country, not just in children, but in many other people, but certainly we need to respond to those needs with children in schools. What we've seen is, uh, is something that we need to become more adept at responding to um, and not see it as such a huge difference because <coughs> we're going to see it every day in our classroom. <coughs> so part of our uh, effort with the BCBAs and BSPs, the system-wide, <coughs> are to bring some of those techniques to the schools, really provide some um, models, demonstration, hand-on support, so that we can replicate some of those techniques that have been successful, not just in Jessica's experience, but with the many people she's worked with across the country. Um, Jill has a lot of the same kind of capabilities as Jessica. She happens to have a pretty successful book, and she's a great trainer. She also just brings in that experience from so many different settings. So she's going to continue. She has gone to the Thompson and to the Hardy School and done some consult. Um, hand, um, she's you know, done observation and done some hand-on training. She, our plans are for her to be training the general ed staff through the success grant. We also have booked her for next November for um, all of our training so that <coughs> people at different levels and there was some real interest from, for instance, secondary coordinators <laughs> in having their staff here from her perspective. It's just kind of foundational to think about this is a part of the landscape of schools now. So while it would be perhaps, you know, wonderful to have a BCBA in each school, we're trying to do you know, train the trainers, train the staff, support people, and, and recognize that we have a common uh, issue here, and we need to work together to respond to it. That's kind of the foundational piece here. I think that that helps in trying to think about how we need to try to gradually respond to the need that we see. Okay. Um, uh, more math. Um, so according to my math, so these asks are about five hundred and twenty-five thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Um, I, I actually um, redid the math with the new numbers for the TAs and the BSPs, mm -hmm. and um, I also added fifty-five thousand dollars for the language-based teacher. Yep. I assumed one FTE there, okay. so it comes to about five eighty-five. 585, okay, and um, right now, if I look at the money that I know that we will get from the town for special ed, going from FY14 to FY15 is 1,070,000. So it's about half of that. If you look at just the 7% that we go um, from in special ed, if I do my subtraction correctly. Uh, so that leaves us a little less than half a million for the rest of everything else that has to go on in special ed, which is you know rolling up the salaries um, and taking care of the um, out of district tuition, the out of district tuition right. that we know we're getting hit with. So, um, and I know that you guys are. This is all still preliminary, but and I just want to make sure that we've all kind of got those numbers. And um, I think that it's probably going to mean that some piece of this doesn't happen. So again, prioritizing it is just going to be, you know. You know, very important for us so that we know going forward what is the really where 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 do we get the most impact and where will we see the most not that they aren't all important I'm sure they are but um, you know where, where will we get the most um, uh, you know bang for our buck as we should say I guess but you know it, it just it's all numbers unfortunately in the end sometimes Correct. Um, you know, I certainly, and, and the coordinators and myself have actually done some of that talking. We'll be doing some more with our colleagues tomorrow about that. I think, you know, the exercise, as I understand it from um, the superintendent, is to really look carefully at the needs and articulate them because whether they're able to be responded to immediately, um, it helps us understand when issues come up next year, where they may be coming from. Um, there's nothing really extra on our list here. Right. Um, there's nothing, there's no big huge initiative. It's more filling in. Um, it's more bolstering up. 
Um, and, um, you know, the, the biggest expansion is probably adding the BCBA, which, you know, I think everybody's articulated those needs. But we're certainly prepared that we need to, um, you know, strategize and try to think about how to make more out of less. Right. So um, I appreciate all the, all the thinking on this. This is great. Thank you so much. Mr. Filman. Will, is, is one of the objectives of uh, these additional hires to, to reduce, or will they reduce our additional placement? That's certainly our hope. I, the hope for three years has been to firm up and um, to expand, uh, Im improve, to articulate um, our response to disabilities so that parents can understand what's available for them. Um, that certainly is the hope. And I, I would say there's certain things on here that are definitely targeted that way. Um, there's, other, um, there's other positions here that are targeted to support general ed students, staying in general ed and getting the kind of support they need in that setting. And <coughs> when you do the budget presentation to us, are you planning on doing, I mean, I, I think it would be helpful, it would be helpful for me and I think for lots of people in the community to, to have kind of a, a, a cost analysis of mm -hmm. special education mm -hmm. that looks at, you know, uh, all direct costs to support students in IEPs and 504 plans, out of district placements. Um, I mean, as, 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 as detailed of a cost analysis as possible so that the public understands what we face. Uh, have you, but I, but I in previous years, there's always been a pullout section yes. on special education. Yes, and I need to look, at, I haven't looked at it in a while. Okay, because if, I mean, I, that really does detail everything that is specifically to special ed, but what it doesn't detail are those interventionist services yeah. that, that dance on that middle ground. Remember when I did the bar chart and I yeah. showed general ed, special ed, and interventions. That like an interventional RTI, you mean? Or? Mm -hmm. uh, reading, ELL services, yeah. the things that aren't technically SPED, aren't technically IEP driven. Yeah. I mean, I can think there's a quick example right here. Increasing the OT time, which is technically, in this case, a special ed request, right. is really targeted at an intervention to prevent more children going into right. you know, IEP. Because they're an OT and they're generally living in the special ed budget, I'd be more inclined to classify them as a, as a special ed expense. But they are not, in the strictest sense, IEP driven. They are actually more of an interventionist service. So I think it's important not to look just strictly at SPED, right. but also to look at those interventionist services. And if you think at some of the other requests we've seen, the, the math coaching and uh, the reading specialist and things like that, those are direct interventionist services. And where we're looking for enhancements to ELL, intervention services. And I think those are, those are the really tricky area because those are always the low hanging fruit when you're trying to reduce a budget. They don't increase class size. They're, you know, the, the, those are the easy cuts because they tend to be pricey people. Right. But they're the worst thing to do in terms of really providing good differentiated instruction and maintaining special ed costs. So they're tempting cuts, but they're not good cuts. Well, I think that's a good point, Diane. I think highlighting those in a presentation to illustrate, educate the public on the fact that keeping these programs intact, supporting these programs is critical to reducing the number of students we have. And to better differentiate instruction for all or better, students. Yeah, better, yeah, better differentiate instruction. The, um, the other thing is that it, it um, the a question often comes up in the public is how how do we how do our how does a percentage of special education cost in Arlington compare to other districts comparative districts have we or do we have that kind of data or is it possible to get that kind of data I suspect sort of okay um, the way the state defines special education not the way we necessarily define special yeah. education but the way the state defines special education you can look at what percentage of per pupil from district to district yeah. is special ed according to the way the state calls it. The okay. state doesn't look at grants as being regular or special ed. It yeah. only looks at special ed as carried in the general fund. So it's a smaller number than what we consider special ed because we include grants that directly fund special ed services. So, but um, you can look across districts and see, you know, for a district as high performing as we are, our special ed costs, you know, our percentage of special ed and our special ed costs are relatively on the modest side. You know, if you look at it in terms of our academic performance, because in very high achieving districts, you tend to see commensurately pretty high special ed costs. And in other high poverty districts, you'll see high special ed costs for an entirely different set of reasons. 
Okay, um, it might, it might, I mean, that, that, I don't know, I have to, I'd have to take a look at the DESE site and see what's there, but that data may be helpful in our conversations with the town about trying to get more money for the schools because there's really two things driving that conversation. Well, it's mostly enrollment, but it's also our, our challenges in, in meeting all the needs of students and uh, with special needs. So I'm, I'm thinking, I don't know, as I, as I saw this presentation, this is very helpful and it gives me a sense, and I, and I didn't do my homework, I didn't, I didn't go back and look at last year's uh, special education section in the budget, that would have been helpful to do. But it's, I think we need a, a, a good presentation that does the co a cost analysis of special education and places us, in, tells the public where we are in the spectrum. Okay. Uh, in the, uh, in the, you know, in, in how we compare to other districts mm -hmm. in the state, how they compare against the state. I don't know, that kind of data I think is important. It's especially important in the conversation we're having on the long range uh, planning committee mm -hmm. that some of us are on. May I ask, when we, when we want to compare ourselves to other districts, when we did the salary study, yeah, we, we comped communities not on educational criteria, but on socioeconomic criteria, That's comparable right. communities in terms of their economic abilities, I would uh, which is a rational basis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, my inclination would be to compare us to other districts like that, but when you think educationally, we, you know, we, pro we might want to look at us more in comparison with people of similar MCAS pedigree mm -hmm. so I'm not I'm you know I, I'm not sure which would be the more fruitful analysis honestly do you have feelings I gotta think about that I don't know I mean the, the group might have a better idea I mean I I don't know you guys I gotta think about it I, I mean either way it would be yeah either way I don't know both seems like overkill I'd love to comparison to Lexington and Concord and see how we do <laughs> well but then that's the MCAS yeah, comparison no. so you know well and, and then we just look at per pupil and know that they're way out spending yeah, us. yeah so I don't know I don't know I'd have to think about it I, I you know, whatever you guys have to make a recommendation okay but I think that so anyway I think that we need a, 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 a better cost analysis would help answer a lot of questions in the community especially among the people we're in we're dialoguing right now with about more mm -hmm. revenue mm -hmm. thanks I'd say that, I, that what Mr. Thielman has just said resonates with me uh, tremendously. Because, uh, you know, one of the things that you, you have to do as a school committee member is to go out in the community and sell the school system, sell the budget. You talk to town meeting members, you talk to the finance committee, uh, you talk to neighbors, uh, and you, know, you want to be able to walk out of the meeting and say, okay, what's the story? This is the story. And I don't feel like I'm in a position where I can tell a story right now. Um, I feel like uh, the, the story that was put before me today is, well, we sort of like what we're doing now, but we'd like another $580,000 to add to it. Thank you very much. Uh, so we're not dealing with context. We're not dealing with need statements. We're not really you know, get, getting the context together so we can have an effective story. And Mr. Thielman is absolutely right. We're taking a look at what's happening in our district with the increasing enrollment. We're saying that the current formula isn't working because of the increasing enrollment. So that every time we talk about budgets and every time we talk about the need to increase uh, the budget for certain areas, the context in that really needs to be clear and it has to be something that is readily un understandable when you're going out in the community and making a comment or statement. And so that it's that sort of context and clarity, not knowing the number. I mean, $585,000 is a nice number. It seems reasonable given the, the, the growth rate in the district, but I have no way of telling the story that our current budget plus 585,000 is where we want to be. And this is the priority that we have to add in, especially because last year we got into trouble because of the way we balanced the budget some of the money that was really a sped cost maybe wasn't in the sped bucket and that was difficult talking to the finance committee about the way we were allocating sped versus non-sped within the context of the agreement in, in, in the multi-year plan. So I hope when we get to this statement next year that we don't have to go back to last year's budget and look for the comparison because uh, you know we don't want to keep last year's paper. We'd want to have the context of where we were and why what we're doing is on the right track, why these specific additions are the right things to do and what the priorities are vis-a-vis -vis all the other priorities we're doing in terms of serving special needs and regular ed students in the district. 
Yeah, I, I think that's what we do in the superintendent's budget message yeah. when we've refined it to that point, but we're not there yet. I mean, we're, we've basically provided yeah. the opportunity for you to hear directly from the people mm -hmm. the things they f that they're identifying as needs, mm -hmm. and we haven't yet gotten to the point that this is our ask. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, I think when I, you're absolutely right, mm -hmm. and, and that's what we do when we get to the ask phase, but we aren't quite there, and because of the timing, of long-range planning and the town budget, we've got a little cart before the horse this year going on. Yeah, I know, but the thing is now I've got a list and I don't know what to do with the list. Nothing yet. Yeah, so why, why am I listening to the list if I don't have the ability to process Because you have the opportunity to answer, it. you ask the people who are bringing forward the requests so but, that you can but, drill you know, them for, for For my way of thinking, if I'm going to be able to ask an intelligent question mm -hmm. about what's before me, I, need be, I, I really need to be able to look at it in the context. And I really don't feel I, you know, okay, I was presented a nice list of things that are going to add to the budget that, that, that are probably the next steps we want to do in the minds of the people working in the district. That's valuable information to have. And, and that, that's a good exercise. But when it gets to our level that you're talking to somebody who's got an oversight role who is not in the district day to day and understands what the real world is uh, for a special ed teacher in, in, in the Odyssey, uh you know, just we need to be able to tell the story and every time that we're sti uh, sitting here before the cameras talking to the committee we need to have an experience where that story is clearly communicated so that we understand and the community understands the overall context and I just don't feel like I have it right now um, I'm going to piggyback a little bit on um, what Mr. Thielman and Mr. Schlickman were um, doing, but mm -hmm. from the user end. Um, working in the school myself, mm -hmm. I see OT, mm -hmm. I have the image in my head of somebody teaching a child the appropriate grip, working mm -hmm. with those fine motor mm -hmm. skills, helping them write, learn mm -hmm. how to capture their thoughts, put it mm -hmm. on paper. Um, when we show this to the community, they see alphabet soup, they see a bunch of varying salaries and don't necessarily understand the difference in why a BCBA gets one salary, a, um, a special ed teacher gets a different salary, a BSP gets a different one, and a TA gets yet another one. Um, there's also not the reflection of what is the difference between a TA and a BSP. And even from our level here, I know in in the district in which I work, you say TA, and I'm thinking that's the person that takes a child that cannot toilet themselves to the bathroom and is mm -hmm. attending to those very basic physical needs. So it's more of a nursing assistant type of position, and that's why, mm -hmm. as opposed mm -hmm. to a learning type of position, and that's why there's a certain salary. But I, Arlington does use their TAs in different ways at mm -hmm. different levels. Mm -hmm. So having that overview as we look at these positions in terms of what are the tasks associated with these positions that need to occur and a little bit back to um, mm -hmm. a different take on what Mr. Hainer said in terms of which of these people are providing direct student IEP service hours and which of these positions are actually part of our pre-referral program or our um, you know assistance with behavior plans which not, are not necessarily going to be direct student hours servicing an IEP, but are directly special ed department costs. Mm -hmm. and, and having that, dis, that delineation is helpful because without that knowledge, I look and I see, oh, a TA is only um, mm -hmm. you know, X amount, and a BCA is this amount, so why not get five TAs mm -hmm. instead of one BCBA? Mm -hmm. And, you know, but when I'm like, oh, it's a board certified behavior analyst that's going to go in and has the ability to assess a child, has the ability mm -hmm. to pretty much create a behavior, a tiered behavior intervention plan that a teacher can utilize so that that child does not require to be pulled out of the regular ed setting and has the ability to access the curriculum with their peers. I'm like, oh, that makes sense then. And that person can impact a lot more classrooms, but without that, that vision, this really makes no sense. Mm -hmm. And so um, I would like to see that 
however you want to get it for those of us that are more visual learners displayed there so that as we're looking at these they're not just numbers they are either in, without defying any confidentiality of course but they are students and how this impacts student learning I, you know I, I I appreciate all of the those recommendations and it may be my misunderstanding of where we are in the process but one of the things I've learned in life is don't put something up there that you're going to take away and I feel like that's where we're at because you know this is, I, I don't want I, every one of these things is necessary but I do realize that there's going to need to be a winnowing down and one's going to be more vital than another I think when we're ready to come back with you know our program and the budget I would welcome the opportunity to exactly talk about the BCBA program which we initiated last year and did discuss but talk about how it actually has worked and I think giving you that information would be helpful what ha have we been able to do this year with BCBA and what do we need to do with the additional person and I'm going um, to push a little bit back yeah. where there is I understand about not wanting to get so much community investment that we can't make a choice about what to give up right but there needs to be some foundation for the initial sell because while Arlington as I've said many times we do a lot with a little mm -hmm. I right. we really have tremendous staff that exceed stu in student performance what they have compared to other communities and I've appreciated that but, perspective but you're right but you know if we're fighting for something mm -hmm. I want to fight for a Cambridge okay. budget so I can over mm -hmm. you know I, yep. it's like and I know I'm not gonna get it but if I aim here I'd rather aim here and end up here than aim here and end up here it's and helpful to know your perspective and what you feel you need it's helpful mm -hmm. to me thank you can I make a couple comments yeah, sure. um, th th good suggestions and I think that we have in the past and will continue to do so is to get more of rationale for what will be our, our our ass as we go through this process because we're going to have to look at this as we've done as I feel is a good way of doing it, is looking at in terms of tiers we actually do have a number that the town manager was able to give me late this afternoon in terms of what um, we will be able to have as a budget number from the town contribution next year which we'll talk a little bit about later but that number in combination with the uh, growth plan that we are we've all agreed to as a community the three and a half on general uh, budget seven and a half percent a uh, seven percent on special ed um, does not cover what all the all of the needs that you've heard over the last month you heard from um, ele preschool elementary middle and high school in terms of the staffing <coughs> in the last two years alone we've had roughly a, li a little over 280 students enroll in our district uh, pre k-12 uh, that in our and our preschool is growing as well in fact we'll probably have to add in some extra times next year so if you apply even the same percentage of what our ratio is for um, students that have an IEP we're looking at in district another 50 to 60 students that we have it may actually be higher because you never know how that how it actually how that particular group plays out but we're, we've been seeing that we've been doing what we need to do with this additional staff with the staff we have and what you're hearing from all the different levels is we don't have the staffing that we need to keep class sizes where they need to be to keep um, uh, to keep caseloads where they need to be um, to meet the the learning needs of students and we probably need to do a little bit better job of explaining that as we go forward but a lot of this is really driven by enrollment mm -hmm. it's driven by also the kinds of uh, needs that we're starting to see we're well not starting but really have seen a growing in the last few years and, and Kathleen is right uh, I've been was at a meeting early this morning and with some other districts and everyone is seeing the same thing everyone being in the the EDCO community so it is um, we are we are responding to a, a number of fact another a number of forces that our s our school system 
uh, has. But you may want to hear feedback from Dr. Mm -hmm. Al Snampy, though, before you mm -hmm. expand beyond that, because I think she hasn't had her chances. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. um, I actually had a question more for my fellow committee members. I appreciate what Mr. Thielman, Mr. Shugman, Ms. Hyam said, and wonder if part of the presentation, if it had an org chart of before and then an org mm -hmm. chart of after with these are the specific tasks that the new people are doing, if that wouldn't answer a lot of what you're asking for or, or thinking. So that's, um, yeah. I think that was my main contribution. <coughs> oh, and yeah. for talking about the analysis, um, I think thinking about the groups that were mm -hmm. looking this is going back to Mr. Thielman's idea, thinking about the groups that we're presenting to, I think we really do end up with two. We end up with the new town 12, and then I think an MCAS uh, even would be a good group to look at also. Mm -hmm. But they're gonna want, they're gonna, I think they're, we're gonna want the one for us, and they're gonna want the other, so mm -hmm. I think we're stuck. You all had a chance? Okay, a um, couple quick things. Thank you, Jill. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you Kathleen. very much for your attention and questions. A um, couple. There's one up there. Sorry. Yeah, that's what I was going to get to. Um, part of the agenda item was <coughs> budget and program update. Right. So, dovetailing a little bit on what Mr. Schlickman so eloquently put out there was just like, tell us a story. Tell us what is going on every day. Tell us what your team chairs are coming to you with saying, scratching their head saying, oh my God, or wonderful, or no, that's, today was awful. Just tell us a little bit of a day in the life. I, I, I hope I didn't put you on the spot here, but. Oh, you did. Oh, great, I'll lovely. Tr I'll try to think about it. <laughs> okay. I, I mean, I think I interwove some of the things. I think some of the work we're doing at the preschool is very exciting because, um, you know, that's the first place where we meet parents who have children with a known disability at that early age who tend to be students that we uh, really need to help support um, during the early intervening years. Um, and we have been able to, at the preschool, start some groups for students that there's, when we have done the intake for them, the students may not qualify for special education, but they are seen as students who could benefit from support. They may be in a more at-risk category or questionable relative to their, the level of need in as far as a disability. So we've been able to run this year um, six of those groups for um, community students and, and parents, and that's been very well received by the staff. And that is run by um, speech and language therapists, the, the um, social worker, um, and educators. And so that's been an addition that we've made this year. We also have been able to have some of our, I in the world of um, child, find, which is something that we're charged with in special education, is finding students who need s services. Um, we have started um, screening, advertised screening groups that ha will happen quarterly is pretty much kind of a general call. But we also have had staff going out to preschools um, to visit when just on a consult basis when they've called us. Those are some things that preschool used to do, but hasn't done for a period of time. So we're really getting back into doing some of that work, and it's been very well received by the um, community. Um, so that uh, that's at the preschool level. At the elementary level, I think I've commented before, and I don't have probably probably the spe specificity that you'd like tonight. But our learning specialists are the programs are doing really well. If I were to highlight in the storytelling is um, the Dallin School, which uh, I think has you know, really done a fabulous job of articulating their learning specialist role. They talk about um, it as a coaching model, and there are two learning specialists with their, their assistants that are assigned to them work within classrooms and are really um, working with teachers as well as modeling with students in a coaching way and helping people understand the children's learning challenges, um, showing how they can scaffold and how things can um, be done when they're not in the room. They really have a real orientation towards the coaching perspective 
um, and not just service delivery um, during the period of time that they're there. And th they had a great parents meeting that I attended where they explained this model and one of the learning specialists explained the difference in working in this district, which he articulated that he came to here to work from another district because of the model, because previously in the district he came from, he was doing um, a kind of a straight tutorial model. And what happened for him was he articulated to the group you know, the time lost in going and picking up a child, bringing them somewhere else to work with them, and then needing to bring them back and not having the time to interface. So the model that they've developed really makes them much more a part of the classroom. I'd say that that's a story from the elementary level. The middle school, um, I have had the um, opportunity through our teacher evaluation system to see more in classrooms. And what I'm uh, really following um, with, with two staff members is um, is their efforts to as a speech and language therapist and then a special education classroom teacher teaching English, co-teaching English and history together. And that is related to one of the requests in the budget. And they do co-planning, which is extremely important if you're going to be teaching together. Um, so it, it, and just the, ener the energy and effort they bring to that the co-planning, they're finding it, they're finding their own time to do that. Um, and they are working with students, they're coming back together, evaluating how it went, and then in trying to improve on the on you know what happened with for the students that day and increase it. So that co-teaching is alive and well at the middle school for the a group of students who were in the SLC that really didn't have the benefit of that kind of model before. Um, if I moved on to the high school, Gosh, I don't know what to say about the high school. There's so many different things happening. But I would really say the change in schedule at the high school where there is the, the blocks at the end of the day for students to get academic support and for the academic support teachers to specialize in looking at executive function skills, um, being able to have speech and language support during those times. So they're not being taken out of their curriculum courses for those kinds of supports. Um, it's built into their day and it's not detracting from the day. I guess that that's a highlight I would say at the secondary level. Um, and that does speak to some of the, the, the requests at the high school so that we can continue some of that. Um, we have some great new teachers um, who've joined our faculty at the high school and um, just to see one of, um, one of those teachers who I kind of my walk-in in the morning passes one of his classrooms, so I often get a chance to um, stop in and see it. And just to see how he's actually <coughs> using all of the high school to work in executive function skills, he makes appointments with the students to meet them down in the, cr in the um, media center, and they have an assignment. And so he, they start it, and he goes down and meets with them, which just is such an innovative way to start the class join them and really start help helping them utilize um, a facility that they may not have been able to utilize before. So that's just kind of off the top of my head, just kind of telling a story. That's great. I kind of just went from one level to another. But I'm really glad to answer questions if you have them. Yeah, how, how about your, um, your interactions with CPAC so far this year? How have, how have those gone? Uh, what, what can you tell us? Well, CPAC <coughs> itself is kind of a very small group this, mm -hmm. this year. Mm -hmm. But I think that we've been working hard. Oh, and I'm so glad you brought it up. Um, uh, tomorrow, uh, on next Monday night, as m many parents will hear in a, a robocall tonight, um, we are having a long planned transition um, workshop. This transition workshop actually will be going from preschool to high school. So there will be, um, it's, it's really planned for students who have special education needs. However, I've encouraged all parents to join us if they have questions of what happens. But it does cover preschool into elementary, elementary into middle, and middle into high school. And then there will be a presentation for um, students as they're leaving the high school, what kinds of transition planning happens for them. 
So that's Monday night at the Audison School, 6.30 to 8.30, <coughs> um, and we're, it's a focus on transition within the district. Now, I know we've had a lot of snowy days, and goodness gracious, if we got snow, there could be a, a snow day. Or I don't want to put that out there, yeah. but it could be. Um, but it's also comp <coughs> Monday night could conflict with other parent schedules or what have you. Is it a possibility that we can talk about having another one of these sooner rather than later this, this academic school year? We'd be glad to do that Great. because I was made aware of the, is a sophomore activity at the high school? Some, something like that. Okay. It's a sophomore night. Always, and always something. I'm so ready up front. As of 2 o'clock this afternoon, there is nothing in any of the individual school calendars or any calendar at all announcing this. And as far as I know, the only, there was on the, the, the calendar at the beginning of the year uh, thing and uh, there is the conflict and I if we could plan on having a second one I think it would be in with yeah, better, so. better, better communication I think uh, it would be very beneficial for all of us to have it so if I could just add this is one of a number of transition activities the middle school does run their own high school night as do some of the other level schools but you know we're happy to consider doing another transition this kind of preschool through high school. We also heard from you know some of the out of district parents about the other this kind of another transition um, model, which I think you've heard about when Mr. Dempsey talks about it at the high school. So that's been a request too from some out of district parents to have a forum to talk about that. I just spoke with a parent about that and. So we'll probably be having a forum for out of district students as well. But I'm glad to consider that. Dr. Ellison. Just, just to go on the transition, um, I got an email, I can't remember which source it came from about this, but the text of the email didn't actually make it very clear who would be interested in. And so if you do another one, you may, as you do your announcements, you may wanna make it, flesh it out a little bit that this is intended for special ed to talk about especially. I just didn't want to exclude anybody, so but, but it would be helpful if, to hear more. Yeah, yeah, it really didn't, I had no idea what was gonna, it just says transition. Okay. And I mean, it says transition from here to here, but it doesn't give a sense of what topics you're talking about here that sound like are okay. gonna be there, so. All right, yeah, to, to get some more information. Thank you very, very much for coming tonight and helping okay, inform us for our budget planning process. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. All right, <coughs> moving on. Uh, Favorite part. Sticking with numbers. <laughs> monthly financial report. Ms. <coughs> Johnson. Um, we are moving right along in the fiscal year. There have been no... Um, there have been no expenses, there's no, no surprising expenses that have hit the books, but the imp full impact of the snow hasn't fully rolled through. Um, so, as, so far, the financial reports for this month are fairly quiet and doing about what we expect at this point. We have no, no additional um, bad news from special ed, <coughs> um, which is always good. Um, okay. so. Mr. Hainer. <laughs> Real nice tonight, just two. Uh, the first one, number 83807, insurance. Yep. Uh, is this our total insurance uh, for the district? Yes, that, that's both the insurance we have in athletics and the insurance we have for the school committee. Okay, um, and right now we're projecting uh, we're done. I mean, th those are the policies for the year, so That's we won't be spending. We won't be spending more. The policy came so, in higher than we budgeted. Okay, so we'll be in in the budget. We'll be increasing it. Okay, and the other one is eight one. Excuse me, uh, eight three one zero two legal services. It's just above that. Mm -hmm. Does that cover all our legal services expenditures? Yes, for both both sped and yeah. general. Um, When we do the budgeting and stuff, I know when we get the breakdowns, uh, they, we're able to determine which services are being put out. Is there a legal expense under the special education budget 
Do we yes. budget it separately? Yes. Okay. Would it be possible when you do this breakout just to separate it for us? Yes. Thank you. Any other budget? Yep. Um, looking at the revenue tracking, the building rentals, right now it says revenues received are, are 88,000 of 300. Um, I'm d is that normal? a lot of the a lot of the payments, particularly the after school, come in at the end of the year. Okay. So it doesn't it doesn't run in a okay, steady so way. It's not, yeah. Just like um, the the foreign visas also don't run steadily. That mm -hmm. hasn't really ramped up yet. Okay. So, that's all. Was easy. Yep. Pensions. Um, confused about why that's an item. Oh. Um, Pensions, uh, we have to pay from some grant expenditures. Mm -hmm. We have to pay a portion. And so which, which report are you looking at? On page 102, um, uh -huh. 81730. 81730. Yep, we, we sometimes pick up little dribbly drabbly expenses. If we were a little off in our salary when we close out a grant mm -hmm. that we owed a little bit more or a little less, I would take it out of the general fund to to get the grant. I mean, you only have a certain amount of money in the grant. Right. And if in fact the salary was slightly <coughs> higher than you originally budgeted in the grant, you have to have a contribution that's commensurate. And I may not have enough money left in the grant. So this would be like little dribs and drabs of those kind of matchings that we have to send off on the grants. So maybe, okay, so I was just confused of the word. Um, it's not actually a retirement. Or <laughs> it, it is because when, uh, in the state, when you pay into the pension, yeah. the state matches, it's just like with Social Security, the employer pays a piece, the employee pays a piece. <coughs> the state pays that piece on behalf of municipal employees, but when you have a federally funded, when you have a certain kind of grant, you have to pay the employer's share, because the state's not gonna pay the employer's share, because the state isn't hiring the employee if they're in a grant. Oh. So that's where you're picking up these little extra pension things. It feels like you're double paying the pension, mm -hmm but you're not <coughs> because in the, st in the state of Massachusetts, there's no employer share for municipality. It goes straight from the state house to the pension fund. Okay. Um, any other questions? Thank you. All right, moving along. Um, discussion on the FY15 budget. Um, <coughs> Yeah. I thought, sure. could this be the part where, this could be it. where, where we talk, where we, we get, put you on center we, stage? We get, we get to say some good news. Okay. Yeah, some uh, really who good Who would news. like to deliver that news? Uh, point it to the stars? <laughs> you can <dovetail>. okay. Um, <laughs> so uh, we did get a number uh, from Adam uh, today, um, and uh, the town is uh, willing to add to our normal three and a half and seven percent, a total of $885,150. Um, the way they came to that number for people who wanna know is um, they took, and, and I really appreciate that they did this, they took the FY13 and the FY14 increase in student enrollment and added them together knowing kind of that we're behind. Um, and if you add those together right now, there are 281 additional students over the course of those two years. And what they did was they uh, agreed to give us 25% of the per pupil cost for each of those additional students. And the per pupil cost that they used was the $12,600, um, which I believe is FY12. FY12's per pupil cost. Um, so when you do all that math out, it comes out to $885,150 of additional. So on top of the three and a half and the 7% uh, on general ed and special ed, as well as we also have that kindergarten offset. Um, so we now have also have that additional money, which I personally wanna say thank you so much to the town, the finance committee. It was wonder, they have been wonderful and helpful in having us in thinking this through with us, and um, I really appreciate the fact we all kind of, um, I think, made it very clear <coughs> that the more money we could get this year, 
was really going to make a big difference moving forward, given that we've kind of fallen behind, given the enrollment pressures that we've seen. Um, and so this really will allow us. And then moving forward, the plan is that we will get 25% every year on the enrollment of the previous year. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? Yeah. That's so. correct. And if enrollment goes down, unlikely, um, then then we would not get that. Right. No. Right. We would th th actually, in fact, that would get subtracted from. <laughs> so this is going to be a separate line item mm -hmm. because yep. there was uh, really strong unanimity, uh, the school committee, board of selectmen, finance, capital, that we we want to adhere to the plan, uh, even though we are close to the end of the plan, mm -hmm. that had been operational for the override, which was the three and a half percent growth on the operating budget except for in the school department budget, 7% on special education. So um, w we're maintaining that. It's just that when you have that kind of enrollment, which actually is getting close to the size of one of our smallest elementary schools, it's a lot of students to absorb in the district um, throughout. This is the K-12 piece of it, not even preschool. Um, I, I want to share my gratitude about it, too, because it, it really will make a, a, a big difference. I will say, and it's just the reality of it, is that the if you were to put a bottom line number to all that you heard tonight and in December, mm -hmm. we're actually approaching more like two million. But we we know that, so it's important to see what you need from the administrators pers uh, and and teachers and principals' point of view. But we know that that's not possible, and we're going to prioritize that as we go through and so you'll be getting the budget subcommittee will get our first <coughs> our first draft of that next week right mm -hmm. yeah okay. so okay. any um, questions on the news for members do you make so a I, ha I have a motion yes i do yes, <laughs> <laughs> i would like to move that the school committee approves the town contribution the total contribution will be fifty million seven hundred twenty nine thousand nine hundred and sixty eight dollars for the fy 15 budget second discussion I just have one question. Just, just, just to clarify, is this, this is a three and a half percent increase, plus the seven percent for special ed, plus the eight eighty five one fifty, and the continuation of the nine hundred and seventy thousand dollars kindergarten fee yeah. offset. Yep. Right. Yep. yep. Okay. Just one. And and the the additional eight eighty five one fifty will be folded into the three and a half percent base for next year. Right. So then that snowballs each year, which is great. Mm -hmm. And I didn't introduce Ms. Hanson. She is with us, AEA rep. Hello. <coughs> Happy New Year. Mr. Schlecker. I just want to say how important it is to do this and, and also that uh, in, in the context that as our enrollment is driven up, the Chapter 70 number is driven <coughs> up uh, so that we're not really uh, costing the town the way it would sound just by getting an additional appropriation. There's additional state aid to back this up. So Explain that more. In other words, uh, Chapter 78 is based on the enrollment the previous October 1. Mm -hmm. So that if your enrollment goes up, uh, the foundation budget goes up. Foundation budget goes up. The amount that the, the state needs to contribute to meet its share of the foundation budget goes up because our local contribution is capped. So that, that, that was what enabled us to go to a free kindergarten is the enrollment increase was above the cap on our minimum contribution. So that as our enrollment goes up, uh, it will be above our minimum contribution so that the additional funding to meet foundation needs to be contributed by the state. So that as the increased enrollment is generating uh, a, a, an increased foundation budget, thus increased Chapter 78 under the formula, mm -hmm. that's sort of where this money is coming from. The, the town isn't taking money from, uh, from taxing local citizens and diverting it to the school system. The, the, this is a function that it also includes the fact that our increased enrollment is generating increased state mm -hmm. support. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Mr. Hanson? I'd just like to add uh, that this was not a quick request by the school committee mm -hmm. and a quick ag agreement by the town mm -hmm. and just get you, bing, bang, boom, it was done. This was after quite a few meetings, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of good questions, a lot of good dialogue, mm -hmm. a lot of information going back and forth, and uh, a lot of... <clears throat> good sincere inquiries made by the Finance Committee, the Selectmen, and the Long-Term uh, Planning, and Ms. Stark, Mr. Thielman, and the other members of the board. 
responding in a way and uh, mm -hmm. I just want to commend everybody mm -hmm. uh, for this. It, it was a, a well thought out, well worked out and mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah. yeah, I really want to echo Mr. Hanner's comments mm -hmm. on that. Mm -hmm. um, Ms. Johnson, yes. Dr. Bodie, Dr. Um, Chesson, and, and mm -hmm. certainly Ms. Starks, chair of our budget subcommittee. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I'm just really, really happy to, to hear this news and that we can we can vote on this tonight. Mm -hmm. And um, and and thank uh, thank you, Mr. Fanning, out there, <laughs> and your brethren, and <laughs> Dr. Bodie. I think it is really ex um, it's it, it's an, a wonderful demonstration of how everyone is working together. And you've said that, but it really was a here's the problem mm -hmm. and everyone talked about it it's like how are we going to deal with this problem everybody acknowledged it was a problem mm -hmm. and so then it was problem solving it and it is exactly right when um uh town manager um anna chaplain and, and and the assistant town manager a andrew flanagan worked on this they w they talked to the department of education they looked at what our chapter 70 was expected to mm -hmm. go and did a lot of modeling with this just mm -hmm. to see where how this would affect the plan going out to uh, the, mm -hmm. the FY19 budget. So it was um, a great effort, a collective effort to deal with a problem that is something that we did not anticipate when we created mm -hmm. this plan mm -hmm. uh, for the override. Mm -hmm. Comments, questions? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those against? Anything John, else? On, yes. Sorry, this, this is out of the ordinary, but I missed your bottom line number. Oh. So oh. you just repeat it. Yes. Fifty million seven hundred twenty nine thousand nine hundred sixty eight. Thank you. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> Dr. Bodie. Moving on to our superintendent's report right now, I believe. Mm -hmm. All right. Actually, Fairly long. Try to make it short, but we're going to begin this evening um, <coughs> with the the pledge. Some of you um, approved and were participated in the development of about five years ago with with Joe Kiro. One of the things that um, Arlington really stands out as being a very uh, very warm and welcoming committee, but sometimes there have been over the years mm -hmm. evidence of intolerance or even um, even hate crimes or, or, or very serious things that have happened. And one of the responses um, to that was an initiative by the Human Rights Commission to put together a response coordination team that is made up of a, a, a lot of the um, key people in various groups, Chief Ryan, for example, myself, there's somebody from the, you know, from the town, um, town manager, Joan Roman, there's a whole bunch of people that are on this, on this group. And we have worked out a protocol in terms of, of communication <coughs> protocol when um, an incident such as this might happen, what would be our response? But part of that work also um, evolved into creating a resolution that I believe has been about five years ago that that resolution was affirmed by the school committee and the board of selectmen and now that we are approaching the Martin Luther King um, uh, holiday, the, the remembrance, I thought this would be an appropriate time since it's been quite a few years to revisit that. And the Board of Selectmen is going, are going to do the same thing on Monday evening. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this is what the resolution um, sounds like. Human rights resolution, whereas our nation was founded on the fundamental conviction that all persons are entitled to equal protection, equal opportunity, and the enjoyment of civil rights, and whereas the strength of our nation is derived from the growing diversity of our communities, and whereas thousands of people of diverse backgrounds live, work, study, and worship in Arlington, visit our town's businesses, and enjoy our recreational opportunities, and whereas all acts of subtle and overt discrimination against people protected under federal, state, and local laws substantially undermine our communities, schools, and the promise of equal justice, and whereas violations of human rights occur in our town, and whereas we can begin to solve the problem of hate by taking strategic and specific actions to promote a sense of welcome and inclusion, and whereas coordinating efforts to combat and respond to such acts of hate and human rights violations continue through the response coordination team comprised of public officials, Arlington Human Rights Commission, Vision 2020 Diversity Task Group, 
and members of the clergy. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Town of Arlington does endorse the efforts of the aforementioned response coordination team and pledges its support for rapidly addressing violations of human rights in our community. And be it further resolved that we, the undersigned elected leadership bodies of the Town of Arlington, will maintain a policy of publicly addressing human rights violations and those who perpetrate them. And be it further resolved that we will unite against prejudice and support those who are harassed or have their human rights violated and be it further resolved that we will support town and community groups in their endeavors to creatively recognize and promote diversity. And I'd like to make a motion that we uh, vote uh, to reaffirm this mm -hmm. resolution tonight. I second. Any discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those against? Okay. Reaffirmed. Thank you. Oh, that's great. Uh, and I uh, didn't mention that on, the, on this particular uh, team of people, they're also members of the clergy from a couple of the churches. So mm -hmm. it is a very inclusive group of people. Well, where to start? Um, I know that there might have been some questions about last week's snow days. <laughs> uh, I actually had only um, one question from parents on it. I know that it was, it's, it, what, what people have to understand is that y you make the best decision you can with the information that you have the night before or the day before. And it appeared that on Friday, uh, on, sorry, on Thursday, that we were going to have continuous snow through the day with as much as five inches of accumulation by the close of school. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a couple of inches might be felt we could deal with but when you're starting to deal with bus schedules and long distance yeah. driving from staff but the hills in Arlington um, it, I just felt that the right decision was to not have school for that day I seriously considered a half day mm -hmm. um, but half days are hard to institute the day before um, uh, one of our contingent our contiguous communities already had a half-day schedule, so it worked out quite well. Mm -hmm. But um, the, the elementary principal has affirmed that putting half-days in the day before can be problematic because s sometimes parents don't get there to, to pick up their children. And, uh, you know, so they've gone to work, and it's, it's, it's just often a much longer day than, than you would expect. So um, that's, that's, that's the reasoning. In general, it's, it's, very, it's very difficult. Um, certainly a lot of people were consulted in that decision. But I have to say, when I was driving in that morning myself, I, I, I didn't come, I came sort of mid-morning, the roads were so slippery. I, um, it was actually quite affirming that that probably was the right decision. And when, if I had done a half day, the, the, the strength of the snow was actually right around then too. So we, what this does in terms of looking forward to the last day of school, it brings us to a Friday. No pressure mm -hmm. going over that weekend, but that's where we will be. So we still have, well, we still have three more days on our calendar. We, this year, by starting before school, we actually have six days before the last day in June, which, and we can't go past the last day in June. So. Uh, barring a blizzard of 78, I think we'll probably be fine in terms of going through the year. I obviously, I would like to not have to get into the last week of June. I think that everyone felt that it was, um, it was, mm -hmm. it made a very short summer, but, in ter but it was also problematic in terms of our professional development. The, it, for parents, it was difficult in terms of camps, and our own summer programs were affected by it as well. We had to change uh, a couple of things. So, we're hoping that we won't have any more. But one of the other things with regard to this that was, um, was concerning, and I, because I did drive a little bit around um, the areas around Pierce and Stratton, and there, in some cases, there aren't sidewalks, but what you see, and, and now it's better because we've had a thaw, that you'll have a couple of sidewalks in front of houses um, shoveled, but then somebody hasn't. So, or what happens, and, and the DPW really tries not, you know, try to fix this, but we've got a lot of corners, you know, you have big piles in a corner, and then, so, you, so children are out in the street often, walking, and that's really very 
concerning and very dangerous, and particularly on slippery days. Uh, if children had been out in the street that, mo that day with those streets the way they were, it could have been very dangerous. So I, I think our sidewalks generally are pretty clear right now, and I would just implore people in town that when we do have um, more snow, which is likely, that, you, p that you, you clear the sidewalks just if no other reason for the children in your neighborhood so they're not having to be out on the street. And um, I think that we, there are um, groups in town that if you're, uh, you can't for some reason get out and shovel yourself, that there are groups in town that um, are willing to volunteer. Certainly community service here at the high school. And we probably should get that list out uh, of students who would be willing to do that. Yeah, that would be great. Okay. Yeah. Well, one of the other um, <laughs> surprises over the weekend uh, was, of course, the cold snap. And uh, fortunate, well, fortunately, only one building in, in all of the town buildings experienced um, frozen pipes, and that was Pierce. And uh, probably what happened was, to the best of our knowledge, I'll know more after, uh, maybe by the next, the next meeting as we figure out exactly what happened, unless uh, Diana no, um, has learned more, that the fir there are two systems in uh, these new schools, and they're all these all these systems are computer um, controlled. And the first system broke down, and the second system should have automatically um, jumped in and started the heat, but that didn't happen. And so we th we're right now the diagnosis is that there was a, um, a software problem and we're working with the heating company. Right now it's just really to get the heat back on, but then after all that's taken care of, which I think it, we're, we're at that point, we'll have to go back and really diagnose what happened. Unfortunately, what that meant was that we had uh, water um, cascading down uh, into the library. And by the way, the reason we were able to discover this on Sunday was due to a neighbor who was walking by mm -hmm. noticed that there was a wall of ice coming down from the third, you know, the top floor all the way down and water coming down that. So they called the fire department. The fire department then in turn called uh, Mark Miano, who is our director of facilities, and then everything started to, to spring into action. So I want to thank Mark. Um, had that gone, a and the particularly the neighbor who caught this, had this gone on 24 more hours, we would have had a lot of damage in Pierce. And in fact, enough so that we may not, we may not have been able to open that day and possibly have to relocate students for a while where we, we cleaned it up. But um, there was water, there was heat that was off in some rooms. Um, there was water damage. I know I was in some rooms on Sunday seeing, you know, pencil holders filled with mm -hmm. water and a number of books were, um, were destroyed. Right now, the estimate is somewhere between three and 400 books in the library because what happened when the water came down, the rug was soaking wet, and of course, everything on top of the bookcases were destroyed. But then, the water star started to be absorbed by the bookcases, and so the bottom rows, all the books became soggy. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, in the, we're at the stage where we're evaluating whether we need to replace the rug um, and certainly we're, we're taking care of all of what all the amassing all the costs. How this works in the town is this. We do have an insurance policy, but it has a very high deductible in the hundreds of thousands kind of deductibles, really for catastrophic um, uh, damage. But there is a fund that has been created. Uh, it's an eight hundred thousand dollar fund that is for damage due to these types of things, and I, I believe that I, I don't know exactly. So I, I probably shouldn't say how it gets replenished if it's used. But we had to use that fund for the high school. We had a similar thing happen a number of years ago. So um, we're 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 doing spreadsheets to find out you know what the total costs are, and um, it, it won't. It probably will be. I don't really want to say right now, but it probably is in the 50,000 range. I, I'm not really sure. I'll tell you the next meeting when we, once we get the final total, because I don't know what the heating contractors have charged us yet. Will that include book replacement? W it'll be everything. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Dr. Allison. Can I ask, at what point, it seems to me that this has now happened twice in the tenure that I've been on school committee mm -hmm. here in the high school and now at Pierce. Um, it seems like it would be helpful, especially on these really cold days, to have someone whose job is to come into the schools, check that the heating system are working, check for open, you know, just do a walk around so that things are found. So we're not dependent on neighbors. I mean, that's great that they saw something and reported it, but mm -hmm. if it could have been reported, if it could have been caught when the heating system failed, instead of just assuming everything's working because mm -hmm. the building mm -hmm. is closed. Well, I think that's a good suggestion, and I believe that that's probably what's going to happen going forward. With the high school, it, it wasn't, it, what happened was the window hadn't been closed tightly and it blew open. And it just so happened that the pipes were at right next to that particular window. So it wasn't an abnormally co cold day, it was just a winter night. This was an abnormally cold uh, Friday and Saturday, and yes, we, prob we, we probably need to make sure that happens. Um, all the buildings were checked on Sunday to make sure there wasn't any other, uh, other problems. Um, unfortunately, we're able to open the school on Monday, and um, Pierce has um, certainly had its share of trials and tribulations over the last, um, last couple of years, but they really rallied and did a, did a great job. Um, there's still a lot of materials that had to be thrown out, so those are uh, also our reading room. There were a reading teacher and our EL, uh, reading coach, um, Evelyn DeRosa, and our, our ELL um, uh, teacher came in on Sunday to start taking the soggy materials and throwing them in barrels. So it was unfortunate to have that much loss of, you know, carefully, mm -hmm. carefully gathered materials. Just to be just to be clear, we, we we have during school vacations we have people walking the buildings, yes, <coughs> monitoring, seeing things. Does uh -huh. that happen daily during school vacation week? Yes, it does. And is part of the problem getting more oversight there and over, uh, supervision when there aren't people in the building because we don't directly employ? Um, well, our custodians generally don't work on Saturdays and Sundays. And then, of course, there was the large snowstorm on Friday that, right. that pretty much kept everybody yeah. home. But there, um, so yes, the, the buildings are monitored hmm. during the week and because our custodians um, um, do not, they do not participate in the, School they're, they're an entirely, they're in a uh, town union. Mm -hmm. Are we looking into the, the software glitch? Yes. And is it a similar software? My, when I spoke to Mark the other night, uh, he said two systems and trying to make that software yes. compatible. Do we have a similar problem in any of the other, a similar uh, setup in any of the other buildings or is it unique to Pierce? I think the two different uh, systems trying to be coordinated by software is unique to Pierce, but that doesn't mean that there haven't been uh, issues at other s the new, newer schools because these schools are so high tech right. yeah. it doesn't take much to break it all right any other questions on pierce <laughs> i'll get you the final number once i know it um one of them let me alternate some of these because there's some really some nice news too let me give you another a, a good good uh mm -hmm. news uh, we have a uh uh, our librarian here at the high school, Stacy Kitsis, has done a lot. I don't know if you've s you, you've been in the media center over the last couple of years, mm -hmm. in terms of how she's reorganized it and, and we we've, we've created it as a learning commons. It's very inviting. Um, <coughs> she's done a lot to um, have that kind of an atmosphere there. But it's really just the way she's organized, <coughs> organized it, and. Um, she has, I she involved a lot of people, a lot of students to help in this effort. Well, her efforts in really <coughs> completely changing around what had been um, probably a, a space that wasn't used very well to a space that's being used very all the time was um, spotlighted in the Massachusetts Library Association <coughs> January newsletter. And I think I sent you that link to that. But anyway, I want to congratulate uh, Stacy Kitsis and 
the library assistant at the library in the high school, uh, Barbara Slade, for all the work they've done on that. Um, we, uh, we had a successful first semester with teachers taking the retail course, and we have another group of <coughs> teachers beginning in late, ja late January, um, the, the next set of re retail. And I think we have, um, the count I had in mind was, I think, hard, uh, it has to be reconciled, but let's just say it's between 30 and 40 teachers that will be taking um, this course. The number I had on my list was 40. So we have a lot of teachers that are committing to doing this work, which is a si significant graduate level course. Um, mm -hmm. uh, what percentage of the staff will have completed the, by the end of the next term? Um, altogether, we probably will have had about 70 teachers complete this. These are all elementary right. teachers. So I would say it's <coughs> about uh, Forty percent, maybe, we still have of a way elementary. To, we still have a way to go, then. But of classroom teachers, right? Yeah. We have a ways to go. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda Bear. Yeah, I know. I was hoping you would. Would you agree with that percent, Linda? And that percent, something like that. The number that sticks out in my head was I think we had about 280 teachers to train all together. So classroom teachers and content area teachers at the secondary level. And I think you're right, 60 or 70 will have completed it after this year. Right. Laura might actually have. The, the numbers, we're talking about the number of teachers that need to take the retail class altogether. Do you remember? Uh, 280 sticks out to, yeah. That's secondary and elementary. And this Correct. year we agreed just to do elementary. Right, right. and then next year a focus on secondary. We, just we, have, we were approximately 60 years. teachers, the 30 in the, that we were doing it the first half and 30 that are doing it in the second half. Are we still getting state money or are we now, is it now on our? That teachers, the cost for the teacher is paid by the state. So the instructor's salary right. is paid by the state. The instructor, okay. Yeah. That's it. Mm -hmm. Will that continue out through uh, the whole 280 they people? Will, no, they will pay for 180 teachers. So we will. To be okay. Thank you. Um, there'll be more on retail another time. I just gave you an no, update no, that we're moving forward, that's all. Um, there was a survey that the Department of Education sent out, and I forwarded it to all parents. Um, you have a copy. So they're asking for um, people to give feedback on a number of things, particularly the impact of Common Core. So I, I've actually had a number of emails from parents wanting more information about Common Core or why they're doing the survey, and uh, and it may be that the parents just honestly say, I don't really know how this is impacting because that in and of itself would be very good information. Mm -hmm. um, but I've only had a couple of parents contact me about that, so I'm, I'm, I have to make the assumption that, that people at least understand what the survey is asking of them. But we're also expected to do it as well. You are expected to yes. do it as well. Mm -hmm. I would like to urge everyone to, in the section where it asks, you know, if there's anything else you can add, that it does actually have an impact on our budget and that it is yet again another unfunded mandate. It is one that I agree with. I am, as a teacher and a school committee member, the Common Core I find very, I like it, I think it is a good thing, mm -hmm. but, you know, the requirements that it puts on, mm -hmm on us are not a zero dollar. Any change always costs, and mm -hmm. I just, I would, I would request if everyone would just put that in there so that they hear from enough of us. But I mean, I, when I filled it out, that was one thing that I, mm -hmm. I definitely wanted to make sure we mentioned. There are costs, and um, the costs involve materials. Yeah, uh, exactly. Professional development. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. And the class and size. time. Yeah. It, it has an effect on class sizes because the kind of uh, work that you're doing with Common Core requires um, uh, class sizes that are not large. I mean, you really, if you're going to really be able to attend to all the differentiated needs of your students in the classroom and, and have the level of writing, the level of s communication, whether it's oral or written, is and feedback on. Um, on students' performance, this is the this takes a lot more time on the part of teachers. 
So yes, it does have it does have an attendant cost to it. Um, we are doing more going to probably do more surveys as we go along, but we have a survey that's gone out. I think Linda, the op the survey for for parents for Audison conferences has gone out. Has the survey gone out for elementary yet? No. Not yet, but it's soon. We're we're ask we're sending surveys out. I think the high school's already done it, mm -hmm. asking parents to give feedback on the conferences, whether they felt that. Um, there was an es essentially well. There's enough time that they met, they met the time and the structure met their needs. We're also asking questions about how the ease in which they were able to um, actually register the students, and we're also looking to see at different levels what is the best time to have a conference. We we found that at the elementary m still parents want to do a, a morning. That was a very popular, and that wasn't necessarily. Um, in our conference schedule. This year, we agreed that we would have two evening conferences at each level. But we want to find out mm -hmm. is whether that really is a uh, true need of parents. And one of the reasons why we wonder that is at the elementary level, the evening conferences were not filled. Mm. Yeah, and more parents wanted to have morning conferences. Mm -hmm. They would call up and ask the teachers. So we want to just have a sense of this because it may be mm -hmm. that when we look at the school calendar, which we're going to need to do fairly soon, that we, we may want to change the recommendation and how many elementary evening conferences are. It may be the two is fine for the secondary level, but it may be that we should do a different kind, kind of conference structure at the elementary. Did that only go out to people who had parent conferences? No, it went out. It's going out I to did, everybody. I did not. Yet did again, you get it from the high school? I did not get it from the high school, and I could not get in to see one of my son's teachers. By the time I got online, the day after it opened, every single teacher was already booked. Yeah. <laughs> so I would love to give some feedback. Oh well, <laughs> I, I am I'm fairly certain it went out like almost right after mm -hmm. the conferences were over at the high school. So it probably went out it went out in December. It was December. the week it was the week before December vacation. And I know because I got it as a high school parent. Huh. So it was I that week. I actually got it. Yeah. <laughs> I just wondered because I wasn't able to make a conference if maybe I didn't get the. Oh, the survey, but okay. But the, but the one for the Audison parents just went out early part of this week. This yeah. week, yeah. and we're we're just about ready with the elementary one to send that one out. Probably when do you, when do you think we'll send those? I don't have spam. Beginning of next week. <laughs> Beginning of next week. We want to get this information in. right away so that we it informs how we do the calendar next year on this. Mm -hmm. And it may be that there's such a desire for early morning conferences that we think about mm -hmm. That's uh, going to be awful late. hard, hard uh, to start. You're going to have kids coming in at noon? Well, <laughs> let's oh, wait and see what the survey says. <laughs> yeah. I know. That'll be but we do want to reach out more and just yeah. get mm -hmm. a, uh, I think that's good. S to see what mm -hmm. parents are, our parents are thinking on this. Um, talking about the high school. One of I, I had mentioned to you back in December that that one of the things that um, was thinking of doing was hiring an architect to look at this building from a programmatic point of view. We already have now the on-site insight report, which outlines the mechanical envelope, um, electrical needs. But they, d but it does it really toward the level of maintenance. You know, you need to do this right now. Of course, if you remember that on-site insight report, everything was in the first year because it's so needed. But it's really a maintenance schedule uh, in terms of the high school. So it doesn't address anything else. It doesn't address security mm -hmm. or technology or um, the flexibility of the rooms to the program, and so or. The, the, the building in terms of MSBA requirements, state requirements on class sizes and science room, science rooms. So 
The on-site insult report is complete. You've had that. We have, we have secured the services of an architect who was the architect on the Thompson building for a month-long project in which we will, we will be looking at the programmatic um, needs of the high school. Uh, so today was the day that, um, that she was here and we had tour, we had meetings with, with faculty members, um, just absolutely mm -hmm. inundated her with data, maps. Um, so that, that, so the plan is that probably it will be the first meeting in February that she will come and do a presentation here at the committee, okay? And then we will also then schedule a Board of Selectmen meeting. Now, whether they want to jointly come here and do it, I don't know. We'll talk about that. Okay. Can you tell us where we are on the statement of interest? Um, we're in the process of writing it. Um, it's due April 11th, but keep in mind, um, we all have to be in agreement on this, and I mean we all, this committee certainly is, right. but the town, um, the Board of Selectmen, and all of the, the people involved in, you know, but uh, key roles. Are they involved in the actual state? creating a statement of interest, or do we send it to them and then bring it back for tweaking? We're going to send it to them and and get their input, but they have to sign it. I, I understand yeah. that. I'm just, April 11th, is that the date? It's, it's three months away, but at the same time, it can be a very short amount of time with everything else going on in the town, with the mm -hmm. town meeting coming up, the Warren articles, and. Mm -hmm. uh, I just don't want us to miss the window. And I, I know you're working hard too and you don't, don't oh, intend to. We're, we're not going to miss the window. But the we might but not have control <coughs> of certain parts of this. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm, I guess what I'm saying is get it to them as quick as we can so that if they have things that we have to change, we're going. We're for it. I just don't want any stalling down the line. Or, and I don't mean stalling. I know they care about it too. They, they, of course they do, but they also <laughs> want to understand about the programmatic part of this, and that was the feedback that we received. They understand the nuts and mm -hmm. bolts part, but how does how the configuration of the high school actually meets the needs of the educational program? That's the part that needs uh, more explanation for them, as well as how the building actually conforms to um, some some things with ADA, but certainly it things with with um, guidelines around uh, space. Just to clarify, this is the statement of interest. I think they need to be signed by the superintendent, the town manager, the board of selectmen, and the school committee. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones that so I think we're just, it's a statement of interest. So we're not at, the, we're not in a, dis it's not like we, the conversation we had several years ago about the size of the, about the um, feasibility study options with the Thompson. It's, we're not at that level. We're of not at that level. So it's, a, it's, I don't, I think they'll give us some feedback uh, the town manager will give us some feedback. I don't. I don't think it's going to be that complex. I mean, I, mean mm -hmm. I, I think it's a complicated thing to write. I don't think it's going to be com that complex in terms of getting the board of selectmen and the town manager to agree to it. I think you can. Uh, I mean, well, they they requested more data yeah. around this, and we're we're getting that data, and we will present it to them. But we're not. In a, but I guess the point I'm trying to make, not well. I realize is we're not in a discussion at this point about the size no. of the building or the size of no. the project. So that's where you really so get it's into just the about discussions. the yeah. needs that yeah. the needs of the building. Yeah. There is no solutions at this point. Right. That's what a feasibility study right. so is all about. That's what I want to clarify people. It's yeah. And I, I you know when you talk with people about it, they quickly want to jump from need to solution, but well, that is a whole yeah. other piece here. That's a different mm -hmm. debate. That's a different. That's entirely different. So I just wanted you to be aware that was happening. And on that topic, um, have there been discussions, further discussions about the Audison and its spatial limitations and what we're planning to do about the Audison um, going forward? Because of all the elementary bump that we're expecting to, and I know there's some attrition between the elementary level and the middle school level, but in the Well, for next year, there's going to be a, an analysis, and the, that's already begun, uh -huh. of space there in terms of perhaps um, moving some programs around, moving some programs, maybe one of the programs moving here um, to the high school, reconfiguring perhaps with some walls. 
some, some other space. So I think that certainly next year and possibly to even to the following year, we the changes that we'll make and will make a difference there. We, we need to free up some classrooms. Mm -hmm. uh, now that we, we know that we have this enrollment growth, we have to, we're going to need to hire some more classroom teachers. And so in hiring those teachers, we need to have a room for them. Mm -hmm. room, rooms for them, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that's, that's the work that's going on right now. And we will, w once we have um, more information about that, I'll certainly share it with you. All right, onward here. Um, we are moving forward with the searches. We have a search for Dallin Elementary Principal and Director of Special Education. I, in for both searches, the organizational meeting is happening next week. And more than likely, there'll be some interviews beginning the week after that. We re-advertised in the newspaper last Sunday, not because we don't have applications, but there might be, there might be someone who was just starting to look. So it, since until we actually have finalists, we, we will keep the searches open uh, for any, anybody who applies and be evaluating those applications as they come in. There will come a point where it will be a cutoff, however, and that will be when we're ready to make a, a selection of a, of a finalists. But I just wanted you to know that that was happening. And we had um, re good responses from parents who wanted to be on the committee. And all of those parents have been notified this week. Okay. The December newsletter was out. I hope you all had a chance to look at it. Because really, it, when you, when you get, it gets all put together, it's really quite um, amazing, all the wonderful things that are going on in this district. Let me just check my, s my list here. I think that covers it. Did you have anything that you needed to mention? No, okay. So that's all I have tonight. Thank you very, very much, <coughs> Um Seeing that there's really nothing to approve in the consent agenda, we're, right? There's, no. okay, nope. we'll skip over that. Um, subcommittee reports. Policies and procedures, Mr. Kaleman. We meet on January 27th at 7 p.m. with Rebecca Bryant, our attorney, who is going through policies. Great. What time is that? 7 p.m. I think it's 7 p.m. Yeah. So, so was it, it'll be posted, so I'll it is already posted. It's already it is posted. posted. I think okay. it's. I know. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Starks, budget? Uh, we had a budget subcommittee meeting this week. Uh, let's see, we heard from traffic supervisors on their requests for the budget coming up. Um, we also heard, and you guys have at your desks, the pink paper um, uh, from Mary Villano, who has been organizing the um, international students. Um, they are requesting a fee increase uh, tuition increase. So the proposal kind of shows you, um, and Mary talked us through these, but if you look at the very last sheet, I think, um, what we, uh, the budget subcommittee recommend is option B. Um, and so the uh, total tuition that they're requesting is that the yearly tuition for uh, international students be raised to $15,936. <coughs> um, and you can see the breakout in fees there is the per pupil cost uh, plus some administration costs plus a cultural enrichment fee. And that fee would actually be used so that um, all students would actually be signed up and go to uh, a series of uh, social gatherings to try to make sure that they are being social. Um, and uh, so uh, that was our um, recommendation. And so I would like to make a motion that the uh, Arlington School Committee raise the fee for international students to $15,936. Second. Discussion? Do, uh, I know this is not a common practice among other districts, but do we have a sense of any other districts that do this and where their fees are? Yes. Um, I asked Mary the same question. She said that we are right in the middle of where mm -hmm. 
most of those are. Most of them are based on their per pupil mm -hmm. cost. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason actually that they added the cultural enrichment fee was because they found out that other districts were doing that. Um, right now, we do have um, a bunch of social gatherings that happen, but because they're optional, they feel like that's why kids don't do it. But if we built it in, that more of them might come because they can just, you know, it would be easier to just go. And so Makes that sense. was the only real, you know, we just had to increase it, one, for, um, you know, for that and for some more administration. The administration fee actually allows us to have a, a, a person who's handling it because we do have... Mm -hmm. Uh, 25 to 30, she said, we students. We do. Um, it makes sense. Yeah. Um, there are other school systems that are able to issue a J-1 visa, which is essential to have international students. Most, and there's quite a few around the Boston area increasingly, for a while there was very few school districts that did it. Arlington was one of them. But they often have only a few students. And what we have been finding with um, having the number that we do have of 20, 25, sometimes as high as 28, mm -hmm. through the education program, we, we actually have um, other students besides through education, which I'll talk about in a second, has a, it puts a lot of strain mm -hmm. on a number of people in the district, mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the school, certainly guidance, administration, because there are a lot of, I there are a lot of work to to register an international student. There's a tremendous benefit. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that's also unique about Arlington High School, which is not true in all the schools that have the education program, is that if a student comes here and wants to get a diploma from Arlington High School, it is possible <coughs> to do that, provided that they pass MCAS, of course, and meet all of the, the course requirements that are necessary. That is actually one of the major strains, and it's actually one of the reasons why a lot of kids want to come here, because we do do that. But we, when we sat back and looked at mm -hmm. it, we realized that this was um, a real benefit and was also very taxing, not only in my office, mm -hmm. um, but also on high school administration and high school guidance. There's also been some issues with ELL as well, uh, when students come that they're, sp they're supposed to have passed a language exam, mm -hmm. and most of the time that they have come with a working knowledge of the language, but not all the time. Are we required to provide ELL students for foreign students? No, mm -hmm. we're not, um, but we do do some. We do do some. And, but again, that, that we, we've increased a little bit through the, the tuition they give. We've increased a little bit of time there. We've added, you know, sections here and there because when you have that many students enrolling in courses, it just it raises it raises mm -hmm. the numbers. It's also been a benefit to Arlington students because when you add a section, it takes the pressure off of mm -hmm. uh, the lock on the schedule, mm -hmm. and they are able to have a little more flexibility in taking that art course or that history course, whatever it might mm -hmm. be. So there are a lot of benefits to being able mm -hmm. to do this. Mm -hmm. But it, uh, it just was clear that w the way we were doing it was um, needed a lot more centrality mm -hmm. to it. And fortunately, by ha mm -hmm. having Mary's done it on a consultant basis this year, but we're going to move it into a position for next year. And you mm -hmm. can start to, s mm -hmm. Rob will put it into a job description. Mm -hmm. But we, we needed some relief in my office from all the J1s, um, all, all of it, and all the phone calls and the parents. It's just, it's, it's a lot of work mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. have this. Yeah. But I think I've talked to the principal of the high school. He still thinks it's a very valuable thing to do, and certainly the feedback we get from the students is that it's it's a it's a a very special and memorable experience in their life. Any further discussion, Dr. Allison? Oh. Will the state allow us to increase our fees? Because I thought there was a cap. Yeah, I asked the same question, like, is, you know, is there any kind of, but there isn't through this. No. Actually, is Educatius that suggested that we increase them. Uh, that says most of the schools that they deal with have a, a separate administrative fee. I think it was uh, public schools um, have pr pretty much traditionally just stayed with their per pupil as sort of a rationale for what to charge. Mm -hmm. But at the private schools, They've been charging, you know, thirty thousand, thirty-five thousand for I this. There's I no, 
There's nothing right in the so state. There's nothing. That, yeah, no, no. So there's there, nothing. There isn't. No. no I, was I know. I asked the same question. Sure I was like, really? There, there is. They're, they're outside. Uh, that's what, why I asked about ELL. Uh -huh. It's not a requirement. They're okay. Made. So it's not. They have to meet. The, they have. If they go for the diploma, they have to meet the state requirements <coughs> for the diploma, the MCAS and things mm -hmm. of that nature. But the other aspects, mm -hmm. we're not required to provide. But you know, she's talking no, about but the I'm cost. talking about the cost. I mean, yeah. what we but can charge, because I know there is a. Okay, I'll yeah. see if I can find it. Cause yeah, I'm mm -hmm. pretty I, sure I, I know because I, I asked her the same question. Yeah. Okay. No, so I, I think we're, we're doing a, the rash. Uh, mm -hmm. we're, we're backing into the number when we started looking at what our uh, extra costs would be. I'm I'm not questioning that. I'm just saying I thought there was a cap set by the state. Right. And I think we're above it, and right. that's not, fine. Not no. for international, no. it turns out. Okay. Not for international students. Okay. Aye. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those against? All right. Okay. Um, we also had, uh, at the budget meeting, we had a couple of uh, parents come. Um, I actually see uh, Mr. Downing in the uh, crowd there. Hi. Mm -hmm. um, he and uh, another uh, uh, parent and community member came and told us about, um, they are interested in investigating ways to get the town to actually uh, help us cover athletic and music fees. So we talked to them a little bit about that process, so we'll see how that goes moving forward. Um, so with any luck, we'll have more of that Thank you. later on. Just, yeah. uh, just to, add to add to that, they're <laughs> contemplating uh, a warrant article. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if they, if it, if they do that, they may come back and ask us to uh, do a presentation and ask uh, for our support on the warrant article at a later date. But it's on their shoulders right now to, to go forward. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, we also um, uh, spoke about how parents can have input into the school budget, which I know um, Ms. Ampey has been bugging me about and I have been trying to, in my head, try to figure out like how can we do that in a way that you know, it, mm -hmm. is valid and here's what they have to say and, and yet doesn't um, have us plan lots of nights out where no one shows up. So um, we did uh, a couple of things. We came up with um, kind of ways that parents can do that. One, of course, you can always come to a budget subcommittee mm -hmm. meeting and obviously our, our next one, I will tell everybody, is next Wednesday, the 15th at 5 p.m. And at that one is when we're actually going to start talking about prioritizing and starting to kind of mold that budget, you know, actually take that number that we have and decide where it's all going to go. Um, two, they can come to any school committee meeting um, and talk during public participation. Um, and what we did decide to do is that next week specifically, we would, um, if enough people wanted to, we would make sure that public participation was expanded. So we would make it longer um, next week, specifically for people who wanted to come and speak on budget items um, and just give us their input there. Our next school Two weeks. Next, next school, oh, yes, okay. next school committee yep. meeting. Thank so um, so they can come to the budget subcommittee meeting next week, the school committee meeting the following week. Mm -hmm. um, they can always submit written budget requests or information to myself and or Karen and we can you know make sure that everybody gets those and I know that our uh, emails are up on the website. Um, and the third, or the last thing is that, of course, there's the budget hearing. And um, Karen and I actually already emailed today, and we're going to make sure that that is um, in the paper three times and really make sure that we try to really publicize the public hearing and make sure people know when and where that is. Um, in addition, uh, uh, an email will go out to kind of through the principals with all of these things to parents and kind of say, hey, you know, if you want to have some input, here are the ways you can do that so that um, so that they do know that there are ways. I mean, they can always talk to their principal, talk to their, you know, any, anyone else who also obviously comes and speaks to us about budget. But we really did want to make sure that people knew kind of what the what the right process was and, and that we were here to listen to whatever budget ideas or requests they had. So um, I thought that was a good discussion and I, you know, wanted to thank Mm -hmm. people who are there because I know that I was having a hard time trying to figure out how we could best do that and I thought that that was really good kind mm -hmm. of way to do that so um, and uh, I already said the meeting time so um, 
that is our plan. That's what I have to say. Can I just, I appreciate that you address or tried to address my concerns. My big picture is just that I feel that we do need to be doing open-ended asks to parents to understand what their concerns are, even if we can't meet those needs. Mm -hmm. um, it informs budgets for prior, for, for subsequent years, or it can shape how we, how we do different things. Um, and I just want to point out, I, I understand that you've come up with some ways that kind of streamline into what we've already got planned, but what we've lost with this is the, the meetings, although perhaps not as well attended as we would have liked, did have some communication outward to the parents about what the budget was. It wasn't just talking, it wasn't just them talking to us. There was also presentation outward talking about this is what the state of the budget is, this is kind of what we're thinking about and things. And and also it was more of a dialogue whereas having people at per public participation, we can't, we're forbidden from dialoguing with them. So I just, I reiterate that I think it's important that people participate. Budget subcommittee would be a good better place to get dialogue. I mean, that's great if people come to public participation, but I think we should be thinking in the future for somehow doing something like a forum or so doing a bigger ask because I worry that we are so concerned that we're, we are constrained by our budget that we can't fix anything that we're not asking and that we still need to know what people think. Even if we can't fix it, we need to know because partly that's how we communicate to the selectmen and everyone that we're not doing everything we need to do. So I, I appreciate what you did. I still feel there's room to go. Okay, great. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Dr. Um, I think it's important to get parent input as well, but I think there's also another source that. Um, is important and is part of the process, and that's our school councils. And I know that the principals do have uh, co uh, conversations about the budget. In fact, that's part of the mandate uh, of a school council. We have done these in the past, and we've had, unfortunately, not very many people show up, mm -hmm. sometimes more school committee people than people that actually come. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to figure out a way, maybe we need to do at some point is also think of, uh, of a survey. Maybe that's a, it's, a little, it's hard for parents to get out. Um, but I, I suspect that the main concern of most parents is class size mm -hmm. and being able to have the, at the secondary level, the choices that, at the high school I should say, the choices in electives. But class size is the resounding thing that we've heard and it's what I've heard from people in other kind of conversations. So to the extent that I think most of our mm -hmm. efforts in trying to prioritize the budget of this year is really gonna focus around staffing and um, mm -hmm. to meet the needs that we've been, particularly at the secondary level. But I, uh, but I also wanted to uh, add to Cindy's comments about the budget meetings. We did talk um, with Mr. Downing about that it's important as, as the town manager has been working uh, on developing this with with many people, but this multi-year plan that um, that kind of conversation also occurs with him and the as deputy town manager because you know any kind of allocation to the school budget has an effect on the plan and has an effect uh, on um, certainly all of the other costs that the town faces so and I, and I think there was an openness to, to do that as well but uh, it's certainly the sentiment is very appreciated we none of us would like to have fees for mm -hmm. uh, high school but as we also said it's awfully hard to not hire a teacher instead of lowering the fees and I think that's the kind of discussion we've mm -hmm. had at this table many times mm -hmm. anything else in the budget well, thank you Ms. Hyde yep Ms. Hyde um, Dr. Allison Anthony, curriculum instruction. Oh, curriculum in CIA has met twice. We met on December 19th and then again on January uh, 6th. At both meetings, we had a good discussion about the tools of the mind curriculum and we heard from a number of par parents who, ha who voiced their opinions. Um, on the 6th, we, the final thing that came together is that Ms. Donovan is going to be going back to the steering committee to discuss 
approaches and some other specific requests and then she's going to be reporting back to our committee about um, ways that some of the concerns can be addressed. Um, we also heard about a new athletic handbook which has been created by the new athletic director um, and that'll be coming to the full school committee once we've got one legal um, question clear cleared up. Um, and then finally we heard from a newly reconstituted Vision 2020 Education Task Force. Thank you. Facilities, Mr. Hayden? Nothing at this time to, from that committee, but I would like to share that uh, Dr. Ampey and I attended the EDCO uh, School Committee Roundtable yesterday, and it was a uh, very informative discussion on uh, negotiations. And from my perspective, and you may add, I felt good about where we are <laughs> on negotiations. And yeah. again, what's said there stays there, but uh, I think Dr. Ampey g gave a, a good response and it was very helpful to some of the other people at that uh, way to solve some of their issues in negotiation. Yeah, and I actually went, um, EDCO has a policy committee um, and I went to that today and they will be, I was looking for ways of addressing the unfunded mandate kind of thing. Um, and they will be having a legislative forum in either late March or early April um, at which we can invite our legislators and they'll have a slate of people to discuss and it's going to address things like the unfunded mandates. And I made sure that the concerns that we have are on that um, and added a few. So I think that will be one way that we can try and communicate our concerns outward in maybe a little bit louder voice than just us talking to them. Great. So dovetailing on that, my, my chair report is that I was at the State House this afternoon and met with, with, met with Shaw Garberly about where things stood in terms of the state's revenue picture. And he said positive things. Um, they're expecting, I think, a 5% increase in tax revenues, but they were not anticipating. Um, you know, he, he expressed an interest in coming to the school committee in a future meeting, and, and I said that that would be a great, great thing to answer our questions and, and uh, hear our concerns. So uh, that would, that's definitely in the future. And in the future for us, I would also like to see maybe a, um, a retreat, if we could get together and talk about a couple of uh, topics that are pending and percolating, and uh, uh, so I'll be sending out doodles for a retreat. Um, secretary's report, Ms. Stark. All right, uh, correspondence for the school committee uh, since our last meeting. <coughs> Letter from Dr. Bodie to Dallin parents regarding the search for a new principal. Uh, an email from Dave Ardito about a free public screening of the award-winning film All Me, The Life and Times of Winifred Rembert on Thursday, January 9th, that would be today, 2014 at 7 p.m. in the AHS Auditorium. Um, email forwarded by me from Judy Paradis, president of the Massachusetts School Library Association that AHS was featured in the Mass School Library Association's monthly newsletter. Email forwarded from MASC asking stakeholders to take their survey. Um, email from Jill Fakit, sorry if I have slaughtered that name, parent of a bishop kindergartner with concerns about the tools of the mind curriculum. <coughs> Superintendent Bodie's December <coughs> newsletter. Mm -hmm. Email follow-up from a parent regarding the CIA meeting on the mm -hmm. tools of the mind curriculum. Mm -hmm. A season's greeting card from Sheriff Katusian and his family. Email from a kindergarten parent in support of the tools of the mind curriculum. Letter from a parent of a special education student regarding issues with the special education department and handling of her student's case and a save the date for Academic Internship Expo to be held on January 14th, 2014 from 7.30 to 9. That's it. Thank you. Uh, we have no need for executive session tonight. Yes. Uh, it'd be remiss in not mentioning that uh, we, we lost a, an amazing person in our community, Dick Smith. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. He supported our schools, he supported <coughs> Mm -hmm. Our dogs, he supported. <laughs> our veterans, he supported just about everyone you could ever want to meet. And he was an amazing man. Um, we're going to miss him. And I know there's going to be a memorial service in his honor on Saturday morning at uh, the Masonic Temple at 11 a.m. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to be there and uh, just like to ask for a moment of silence for mm -hmm. Mr. Smith. Thank you. 
All right. Uh, motion to adjourn. So move. Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 We are adjourned. See you in a couple of weeks. All right.